Okay, Diane, please let the record show. Oh, I'm looking over here. <laughs> Years of a habit. Please let the record show that all members of council are present with us this evening. Yes, ma'am. And has anyone seen uh, Representative Matt Rohite? Is he still planning on coming? He's in, in. He's calling in. Oh, okay, good. Good. So let's introduce our legislator. Get a legislative update from Representative Matt Wilhite. Matt, can you hear us? Any luck? Okay, here's what we'll do. We'll keep trying. We'll keep trying to get him on the air. Let me know when you do, and in the meantime, we'll proceed with the meeting. Um, right now, we're going to go into reports, and I do have a report to share with everyone this evening. Go ahead. I'm sorry. We got him. Matt, are you there? Thomas? Thomas. That's his undercover? Oh, no, it's eight. Oh, oh, oh okay. <laughs> Matt, are you there? That makes sense, actually. Thomas Valerie? Earth to Matt. Unmute your phone. Star six. If Thomas Valio is here, but I believe you unmuted the wrong line. Okay. I was guessing because it said myfloridahouse.gov. That was a good guess. Yeah, <laughs> good guess. I'd go with I that. guess we have someone else from the Florida House. <laughs> <laughs> I, he's not, I don't, I don't see, see any other name that may be his here, though. Okay. So, should we proceed then? Okay. Oh, wait, where did Diane go? Okay. All right, we're going to start with reports. And um, I'd like to share an update report on the Transportation Planning Agency. We had a meeting this morning. We usually meet the third Thursday morning of every month. Just a couple of brief things to report. Um, today, we made the uh, agency or the board gave approval to the the final approval to the final 21-25 transportation improvement program. Um, <clears throat> there was conversation on the, on this, and and the reason why I say final is because the the board works on this this the T what we call the TIP the TIP for several months, and we have a cutoff point where from a statute standpoint, we have to make a final approval of this plan and move it forward. And that was that uh, today we had to make a final approval. Even though there were discussions um, from members of West Palm Beach of still trying to remove State Road 7 as a project from the TIP, they actually requested a vote and the vote um, was did not uh, prevail. Uh, so it is still part of the TIP and it is going forward with that. The other thing we talked about today that was of in significant interest is that we had a COVID-19 update in terms of what impact this has had on travel um, and uh, traffic. Uh, there was a survey done that indicated people, 76% of the people who responded to the survey are driving much less than they were before. Uh, and that bears itself out because we last, if you remember last time I reported, we got a report that overall traffic had diminished to by about the, to, to the level of 40% less traffic. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to see more traffic back on the road now. Now we're in this reopening phase. Uh, the other interesting thing in that survey was 31% of the people who responded indicated they are uh, taking less, uh, using uh, mass transit less than they were before. That one is probably not, not a good indicator, but uh, 
is, is I guess it has to do with people being comfortable with traveling in public transportation. Um, I will tell you that Palm Tran is taking extensive efforts to uh, make traveling on Palm Tran resources safer, and, and, uh, and they're doing a lot of things. They're, they're limiting the number of people they're allowing on buses, and they're doing cleaning in a more, more uh, uh, rapid fashion than they were before. So that was that. And today we had, after our regular uh, TPA board meeting, we had a special public TPA uh, meeting uh, with West Palm Beach. Um, I don't know if I, I think I reported this before, but West Palm Beach has filed a lawsuit against the TPA uh, ruling that they didn't follow their procedures to have the uh, State Road 7 project put back on the long term, um, the long range uh, transportation program, and uh, which was done and it was put back on there. So one of the procedures when you have governmental agency where one agency is suing another agency, one of the procedures involved is something called F Florida Statute 164. And what that requires is that the two parties are kind of forced into kind of sitting in a room and trying to work it out, all right, and, and resolve the issue so that it doesn't have to progress to something that has to go before the courts. Uh, so that was, uh, there, there's a, a pres pre prescribed sequence of events, and today's event was to satisfy the requirement where we, we met with the, the uh, West Palm Beach representatives, and the resolution was no resolution, okay, essentially. Uh, but we did that, and we did it in good faith. So uh, we're moving to the next step, which is now uh, what was called a mediation meeting, where there'll be a mediator involved in trying to resolve the dispute between the two agencies. So I, I don't have a date when that's scheduled, but I'll give you an update on the result of that when it does happen. And with that, I'm going to start with Selena tonight. Good evening, everyone. Actually, I had a quick question, Mr. Mayor, on the TPA. Did they, since businesses are starting to slowly open up, did they announce when the mass transit will go back to the regular schedule? So there was no, yeah, there was no announcement from the county. You know, you know, one of the things we do at the meeting is we get updates from local agencies. One of them is is Palm Tran. They, they had no update for us today. And try so rail and stuff. Okay. Right. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the staff again as we continue to change through this. So they've d done a great job. So thank you very much for everybody. Also, uh, the village has their summer camp that opened up this week, so there are a few spaces left. So if you have children that are under the age of 13, please have them call the rec center because they are doing a modified summer camp. Uh, Palm Beach County, there's the checks and balances guide to the county finances and fiscal year end report. Their end of the year is uh, September 30th of 2019, so this is when the report just came out. Just a couple of things. It's really interesting, and if you want to pick this up, um, but they talked about Palm Beach County unemployment rate is 3.2. Florida was at 3%, and the U.S. overall average is 3.3. So we're right in the middle of that. This is everything up through September, 20, uh, September 30th of 2019, so remember that. Uh, Palm Beach County's leading industries are tourism, construction, ag, manufacturing, and bioscience. So all of those, except tourism, have still maintained their um, thrivingness throughout this whole time. Uh, the other things they talk about the healthy part of the county is based on the number of mortgages and foreclosures. So the number of mortgages that have been issued are up 3.12% from 2018, and foreclosures are down 9.29%. So very interesting to see that more people are buying homes and staying and, and um, contributing to the county. It talks about how your property taxes are calculated, what your annual tax bill funds, and the county budget and stuff like that. So it's a great uh, piece. The other thing is I was on a call with the Florida Chamber earlier this week, and they just went over some things. So one thing that they're talking about is that uh, there's a 15 on the amendment into the Florida Constitution. They want to add that to have a $15 minimum wage. So who wants that on the ballot, and what does that mean for businesses, especially small businesses? Um, you can go on the FloridaScorecard.org to see um, the COVID-19 score tracker, and you can put in any county and any information on there, and it'll give you a real-time number, which is neat just to watch day by day. Um, the president has given each state governor the ability to determine when they can begin each phase. So Florida's governor can determine what we're going to do. They're looking into um, most of the state into phase three. We are currently still in phase one, and I know they want to keep us in phase one. Um, 
PPP Flexibility Act key changes that they're looking at. So anyone who applied for those, a lot of small businesses that did get this funding that they had, they're talking about extending the loan forgiveness from eight weeks to 24 weeks, that it requires 60% to be used on payroll costs. So that's down from 75%. And then it increased from one year to five years to pay it back. So those are some changes. The, um, the IDLE, which is the part of the CARES Loan Act, is now being given to more than just agricultural. That was for other expenses that they were using for um, overhead cost that others can apply for. And anyone, this is interesting, but anyone who receives PPP money must report any employee that refuses to go back to work. So many employees are saying that they're earning more in unemployment <laughs> versus going back to work. So they don't want to go back to work. They want to stay and collect their unemployment. So if you receive PPP money and your staff refuses to come back to work, you have to report them. Um, the unemployment compensation concerns that the state is now looking at is that Florida has spent nearly $1.4 billion in unemployment compensation. And pre-COVID, the fund was nearly $4 billion. So it's interesting to see how this translates from Tallahassee and how it affects us locally. Um, and September 30th, the date will be set for unemployment tax rates and the length of the benefit for 2021. So if the trust fund is depleted, all employers may face an increase in unemployment insurance. So that really does affect our small local businesses as well. Um, we in Florida have had no workman's comp claims, but th other states have, and those are primarily from the healthcare and the first responders that are receiving those, so that um, some employees are saying that, they're, that they have contracted COVID, that they want to sue their employer. So right now in Florida, we haven't had any. None across None, the whole state? Not across the whole state as of Tuesday. It's early. It is. Yeah. <laughs> but it's happened in other states, so they said none here yet. Um, the Florida tax revenue has sharply lowered this year, and they, uh, they expect that the governor is going to veto more projects. So it's it, going to see now we have a $93.2 billion budget that will be altered. So any projects that we had coming through that we're waiting on funding for um, will be interesting to see what he still passes. And that's my report. Thank you. No, it won't make you mad. Okay. Jeff. Oh, good evening, everyone. Uh, two things. Uh, you can't really talk about much without talking about COVID. Um, so uh, the good news is that the, uh, the school district is working hard to try to figure out how school reopening will look. Uh, and they've got a number of things that they're doing right now. One is a task force uh, that uh, is looking at three primary options, and, and they are returning to school as it was before COVID, kids on campus and that kind of stuff. Another is to continue the distance learning which they've been doing ever since March. And then third, of course, is a mix, combination. And there are a lot of possibilities there. Uh, so this task force is taking a look at all three of these. They're supposed to report to the school board at the middle of July with a recommendation. Uh, we have a member uh, of our community, actually, uh, Principal Armas from uh, Royal Palm Beach High School is a member of that task force. Uh, so um, I'm sure we're being well represented but one of the things that the school district is, is doing also is trying to get input from uh, people most directly affected by their decision. And, and of course, that's primarily parents and the kids. And so they've sent out a survey uh, to all parents. And those of you that have kids in the school, you, you probably got the survey. And um, uh, they um, are looking for input on things that include not just what does it look like on campus, whether to come back to campus, but things like transportation. Athletics, uh, extracurricular activities, and all of that. So they've reached out to the parents for that input. Um, I've, I've been told unofficially that emerging results are overwhelmingly we need to get back to school. Now that you can put quotes around that, but you can imagine um, that there are a lot of caveats to it. In addition to that, we also have an opportunity to engage in a virtual town hall meeting. Uh, they, they are arranging it by regions slash areas, it turns out that one of the areas that's going to have a virtual town hall meeting uh, will be the Western community. And so we are currently scheduled for that town hall meeting on uh, June the 25th, next Thursday at 6, 6 p.m. Uh, the details of how to get online and that type of thing will be um, on the uh, district website. So uh, be looking for that. And it is an opportunity not only to provide input, but also to 
to kind of get a big picture description of what's going on and what they're thinking about. So, um, again, uh, reopening is, is, um, is, a, is an important consideration for a lot of reasons. I mean, the e economic impact is an interesting uh, side effect of this, of this whole thing. So it's a really important step in a, a forward direction. On a little less serious, um, and yet still serious, topic, um, it's <coughs> there's a group of municipalities that are, have gotten together, and you may have seen the Palm Beach Post article this morning that talks about this, this group um, <laughs> that is um, putting together a informal uh, competition between right now 11 uh, of the larger cities in Palm Beach County and, and we've been invited to join that group. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting situation because it turns out right now, and I think this is still true, we have done better than anybody else in the county in our census uh, so far. We're, we were at 69.9%. In fact, I think that's what the article said. Uh, and Wellington is right on our heels. Uh, they are, I think, one percentage point behind us. Three? And so the whole... Uh, idea about getting together for a competition to see who does best from some demarcation point forward. That is a timeline to be determined. But it's really more about more about what uh, we can do to keep the census in front of everybody so we don't lose track of it. It's not like we're, we're, we're not distracted by a lot of things, but the census is a 10-year kind of an impact on us. So Trying to keep it in front of everybody. Uh, somebody thought, well, gee, this is a really great way to, to do that. Uh, let's, let's give it a little hype. Let's put it in the limelight. Let's do a little competition. So if you haven't read the article, read the article. But um, there's still some details to be worked out yet. But um, I wanted to get a sense of the council to see if uh, we want to participate in that. Well, by de facto, we participate because we, we're leading the, the pack right now anyway. So. Well, what, 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 other I than having all people actually go out and do their census, what other work? What? You said it's our going forward thing, though, Craig. So no, it is where we, no, going. no, it's not going forward. The way I understood it, no, and no, I got, it, is. it is going forward. I got a call on this, and here's what I was told, okay, that it's, it's basically to create um, a focus, all right? It, 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 you're right, we're all distracted with other things. But the bottom line is, whatever the numbers are, the numbers are at the end, at the end of the day. Right? Whenever the census, people say, we're done taking our census, we're done. Right? Here are the numbers, here's where we are. That's what it is. And that that's, was my understanding. And that's true. Yeah. However, what they want to do is from this point forward. What does that so, mean from this point forward? Well, what it means is we're at a disadvantage by being in the No, that, I so, think that makes no sense. I, I think the whole thing is a little, it's, it's, it's okay, cute. So it's cute, I, but can I, can not I from ask, this point forward. That's can, silly. Can I ask for a sense? Yeah, let's get a census on a census. Let's see, we're in. <laughs> let's, let's get everybody everywhere to fill out their census. Which is the, we're, we're doing that. Yeah. You want to comment on this? How we get a process? What it means is basically that we continue doing what we're doing. Uh, they keep track of it from, oh, let's say, um, uh, the beginning of the, the coming month. Uh, and we follow all the way through to the end of October, and they look at how well we did from the beginning of next month through the end I, of October. I don't, I don't think that makes any sense. You got any comment? Well, the census goes through October. There are some changes in the census from what they originally uh, planned. Starting in June, they, they were planning to go, the federal government was planning on going door to door. That's been postponed to August. Um, the census has asked the Congress for an extension from their deadline of providing the information to the White House of December 31st, uh, 2020, right. to March uh, 31st or 30th, 2021. So they have not got that extension yet, uh, but the going door to door has been postponed because this, this step of everybody mailing it in was supposed to end at the end of May, and then June they were supposed to go door to door. Um, like I said, they're putting that off until August because of COVID-19. They are asking for an extension. So, you know, part of what they're doing here is is just trying to put it out in front of the press and out in front of the people it's and keep it alive. Yeah. Um, now, you know, whether we start from zero or whether we're still counting up to the maximum percentage, I mean, we're, we're at the highest percentage now of the large cities at 
68. 69. Six, almost 69. 69 yeah. point, point something. Or 66.8 or 60, somewhere up in the upper. Um, the chance of us getting get anybody in over 80 is it would in the large cities is going to be kind of tough. There are smaller cities that have gotten there. So, you know, keeping it alive, keeping it out in front of people does not hurt. Right. I, I so, that's well, fine. Let me, let me yeah. just finish up on that, though, to say that um, that the idea here is just that. So let me tell you what's at stake. All right. Whichever <laughs> municipality scores the biggest hike in census participation will be presented a trophy from its, you got to love this, vanquished opponents. To rub it in further, this is not a really great, great sales pitch here, but to rub it in further, the losing cities will have representatives wear the winner's logo shirts and hats and branding at a trophy ceremony. Now, if, if that doesn't say this is all about just huh? kind of... If, I refuse to participate. If that doesn't, if that doesn't say <laughs> it's all about just having fun, trying to keep the focus on that, I don't know what does. I, that is not a serious competition. That, that's, that's just kind of a, a little thing. Well, where I come from, once the race, once the, the, the horses are out of the gate, the race is on. You don't now say, oh, wait, wait a minute, all right? From this point on, the last half mile is what we're really going to count. Well, you come from a different place than I come that's from, right. so that's an okay thing. Yeah. But here's the deal. We were, we were not under COVID, and we are now. And a lot of people, a lot of communities, a lot of municipalities have lost track of what's going on. And they've lost it. And this was a, an attempt to regain it. So... Um, I think if we can be supportive, that's fine. I, I don't get the competition and the, the silly tchotchkes at the end, but I think we should be supportive and help our fellow cities however we can. So I guess we're in, whatever that means. Okay. But I was just going to say that it's at this point because there's such a small margin of how much higher we can go, and if it's from this point forward, if we can only get three or four points, no, more this point forward, I expect this to be at 100%. Are you way. knocking door to door? That's not my job to knock door to door. <laughs> you have people we're paying to knock door to door. I did that job. I like job. a separate wager with you as far as that no, goes. No, I'm not joining any separate <laughs> wages. We all right? You're not going to go up We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Thanks very much. That's the end of my report. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to add a note on your report <laughs> on, on the school. Um, I had a long conversation with uh, uh, Superintendent Vinoy, I guess it was a week or so ago. And yeah, he spoke about the three options, but I, just my reading between the lines and the impression I got was that we're probably gonna see this hybrid model in place. Primarily because that's the only way they can have the capacity to have distancing in the classroom. And what he's taught, what they're looking at is they would have shifts, you know, and so it might look like, you know, one group of students go to class Tuesdays and Wednesdays. The other group goes Thursday, uh, uh, rather Mondays and Wednesdays, and the other one Tuesdays and Thursdays. So you might wind up with the children going to school two weeks, two days out of the week, and the rest will be homeschooled. Uh, and they, they are looking, they've got a lot of lessons learned, even though I think they did a great job on a very short notice to get the distance learning model in place. Um, they, they learned a lot from that, and their, their staff, their teachers are a lot more uh, up, up to speed on how to make that work effectively. Here's a challenge. The challenge is we have a lot of parents. When everybody is back to work, there are a lot of parents who, depending on the point where they can drop the, the, the child off at school in the morning, go to class, after class, they go right into aftercare at the school, and then when, at the end of aftercare, they would come and pick their kids up after work and take them home. So. In this equation, that's an important, important uh, component that, that needs to be addressed. It's not all the school's problem either to do that, but it is, that's real. And a lot of, a lot of homes and uh, families are going to have to navigate that as well. So They also talked about year-long learning as well. So that's the other yeah, option talked about to go throughout the whole year. I don't know how popular that will be with the kids. <laughs> but yeah. Well, you know, that's an example of stuff that we talked about for a long time, right? Yeah. And something like this COVID experience may push us further in that direction. So I, that's think, an I, I think um, you know, we're going to be dealing with the COVID experience for quite some time. And I think we're going to see a lot of things change. Uh, the whole, it's, there's already reports across the country that a lot of companies are rethinking 
whether or not they really need to have everybody come into the office every day. And why can't they, if they can work at home and be just as effective and productive. And believe me, um, <laughs> I've lived this issue. When, you, when you're looking at, uh, and I'm talking about more, you know, the big metropolitan areas where you have, you know, a lot of office buildings with thousands and thousands of people coming there every day, companies will be looking at how much lease space, office space they need versus they, they can reduce that number if they shift a large number of their employees to be able to work from home. So I, it's interesting how this has evolved, but I, they're, they're already reporting, the economists are looking at that being an eventuality that might come out of this at some point down the road. So stay tuned, as they say. <laughs> That's it? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Jan. No report this evening, Mayor. No report? Okay. You got them? Why don't we let him let him on, and you and, and Keith can come in after with your report. Is that okay? All right. Okay, thank you. Matt, you are unmuted. Are you there? Yes, sir. You're on. You have it. You have the mic. Oh, okay. I didn't know if I had a camera. I could see. I, I, I was just making sure of the interaction here. So, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to join you. Uh, unfortunately, we're joining each other in this way, but I'm still happy we're able to do this. So it uh, means we're all still governing and uh, healthy and uh, able to do. Uh, so, um, you know, just give you a short little update, obviously, about what happened during uh, our last legislative session. Uh, we actually went about an extra week. We normally go eight weeks. We went about nine weeks because we just couldn't get everything wrapped up. Um, and so... Uh, Are you there? Hello? We lost you. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you now. We had a little break in there. We have another. There we go. Share my webcam, too. There you go. There we go. How's yeah, that? you are. We can see you now, too. All right, now I can even see my. There you go. That's even better. So, all right. So, uh, I don't know where you caught me or uh, where I left off. I was saying that we had to go an extra week during session this year, this last year. Uh, so we, we wrapped it up. We're, we wrapped up right around about a $94 billion budget. We're anxiously waiting to see what the governor talks about. He's been talking uh, the last few days about uh, what would be cut. I'm very nervous because the appropriation that I got on the budget was one for you that was put on a uh, short list of cut items, but uh, hopefully that doesn't happen. Uh, wow. Uh, you know, a couple of bills. A couple of things I worked on this year uh, that are actually on the governor's desk. One right now is the Alzheimer's disease. Uh, yeah, until midnight tonight to either sign it, veto, or, or it just becomes law. So I'm hoping tonight at by midnight uh, the action will be that it passes. And that will assist our Alzheimer's and dementia patients by creating a dementia Alzheimer's director under Department of Elder Affairs. So it will really keep a statewide database and knowledge about where we are with the disease and have a central point to be able to understand uh, information, share information, and, and who to talk to. So hopefully we'll get that, uh, that'll pass tonight. Keep trying to move that a little bit. Uh, and another bill that went to the governor yesterday was an automated pharmacy bill. And so this is a, a machine, basically a kiosk, like an ATM, where you could get your prescription. Now, let me preface that by saying there are no controlled substance or narcotics in this machine, okay, none. It is meant to house and distribute your uh, cholesterol medications or your diabetic medications or maybe some antibiotics or things like that. Uh, so hopefully that uh, will pass. It already passed and the governor hopefully will sign it. There's a lot of support for this. And I think it, and what we're talking about right now and what we're having to do during this uh, pandemic is this would allow a person to get their prescriptions without having to go to a pharmacist, actually touch them or touch have interaction with them. They would go to a, simply go to a kiosk you would talk to a person like we're doing, real-time, face-to-face, and it would dispense your medications after a lot of questions and your insurance and verification and things. So it, it actually is, I wish we would have passed this, uh, it would have been signed a few months ago because it would actually, I think, work right now for what's happening. So hopefully that will get signed uh, here. I just went to him yesterday. Uh, a few other things we worked on, obviously, we were working on some things for uh, veteran suicide, um, husband and wife communication privileges. I'm sure our attorney there understands that, uh, that we 
want to make sure that anytime a, a child is uh, anything happens to them, that those communications, and we have every aspect of being able to get the information to hopefully go after and prosecute someone if they take advantage of a child. Um, we did uh, some. We did a bill for first responders for our school board police, and I'm glad uh, their vice mayor Hamari were talking about schools opening. Uh, I'll mention I was just assigned to the uh, superintendent just assigned me to a school board opening task force. So if you or anybody else in the village there has any input, I'd be very happy and willing to communicate that to that committee as we continue moving forward. Obviously, you heard the governor and secretary of education say we're opening in August, uh, but I also hopefully they realize that in Palm Beach County, the state of Florida, we're becoming a hotspot and our numbers are rising every day and more more than we've risen in the in previous times. I mean, it is just completely on the rise right now. Uh, we worked on something, uh, offenses against firefighters. We had two Jacksonville firefighters that were stabbed uh, as well, responding and taking care of someone. So we were trying to make that offense stronger. Uh, and a myriad of things. I did get six appropriations in the budget. As I said, one of them is yours, a couple for Lock Edgy Grove, one for Palm Beach County Fire Rescue, one for Wellington. Uh, so we're still hopefully awaiting those. Uh, you know, we're really concerned about what will be cut out of the budget here because of the shortfalls in tax revenues and, or uh, sales tax revenues and, and where the state comes from, the, the, the tourism and things like that. So I personally will tell you, I think that the governor should not veto a thing. I think that every bit of money that we spend in this budget that goes for building projects, building jobs, creation, uh, all those different things. I mean, we put it in the budget. Uh, it would pass, you know, everybody through the House and Senate and, and – I think are all good projects, and I think that everything that we cut out of the budget is going to stifle our economy and moving forward even more. So we have reserves. I'm sure you have reserves. Just like we have, I'm sure you have reserves. And those are for rainy days, and this is a rainy day. And I think that our state will come back strong, but I think we should take advantage of those reserves right now and, and continue to try and prosper and grow. And so I think that we should use those reserves and not cut anything from the budget, especially a project for the village of Royal Palm Beach, of course. Um, so those are a couple of things. Uh, I would just like to mention, obviously, our coronavirus cases. Uh, you know, as of 11 a.m. today, Palm Beach County reached 9,472 people that are testing positive, uh, up 210 today. Uh, and so as we continue to grow, as these cases continue to grow, we keep watching them. And just this last week, uh, Dr. Alonzo updated the Palm Beach County Commission on where we are and how this epidemic continues to grow. And every Tuesday and Friday, I'll tell you that our state elected and federal officials talk on a conference call to communicate all this information. And, you know, there's many of us on there that are worried about where this virus is going and what's happening. I, and I'm sure you've been out. I've seen people at a lot of places you go that not one person is wearing a mask. Um, and I just think that obviously they're not a county building because county buildings that you have, county ordinance says you have to have one in a county building. But I just don't think, I think people uh, did exactly what I was concerned about was as soon as we uh, let them out, they went out and started to do things, they would just, it would, they just would completely forget about the fact of how transmittable this disease is and how many people are being affected. They, the good part about this is, is at least the death rate is down and it's not growing like it was before. And I know that, and I will tell you, and Dr. Alonso confirmed this, don't be fooled that someone will say you say to you that we are having more positive cases because we're testing people. That's not true. We're having more positive cases percentage-wise by the testing than we did before. So the numbers are staying up, up they're above what they were in positive cases, no matter how we were testing, how many we were testing. And so it's not just because we're testing more. There are absolutely more positive cases. Um, well, I'll leave it there. I guess uh, if you guys have any questions or want to talk about anything, I'd be more than happy to answer that. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to um, update you a little bit. Obviously, I'm rambling around in different areas. It's a little different, obviously, when you're on the computer and not talking. And things. But uh, hopefully this uh, insight helps you a little. Know that my staff and I are still working every day. Our office is in your town. However, they're not always there, but they are answering the phones and checking the voicemails and working on their uh, emails every day. And I'm sorry, one last thing I will say to you, and I'm, I'm sorry to say this, and I know there's some people in your town and you've heard this. It's very unfortunate that our unemployment system in the state does not uh, work the way it should. And there's still a lot of people that are hurting that still are not getting benefits from unemployment that have applied and applied and applied. And so I think the state is working hard to 
to try and fix that. And I know it's not fast enough for your residents or our constituents to get it uh, fixed, but I'm hoping that we can try and give them some kind of relief and help them here in the near future. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a, a quick question. I don't make sure I understood what you said. So you're saying that there's a, a notion that the legislator can convince the governor to to not take away some of the what would have been projected and budgeted uh, uh, programs, not take those away, but but maybe kick in some reserves from the state. Well, I mean, every person that I've talked to, I've asked and conveyed the message that it's my opinion, and I've many people that I've talked to have had the same opinion that they not cut things out of the budget. Because again, in this economy, as things are decreasing, if we start cutting things back, we are not going to continue to thrive and prosper. And a lot of those road projects or right. all of those things that needed to be done, we can't afford to take a year off and not allow those projects to happen. Um, the governor did say, and uh, I just read a, a, a email earlier that he did say that we do have reserves. And he was looking at reserves, although I'm sure there will be some projects that will be cut. But I think in the message of how I read it, he was looking more at using reserves as well. Okay. Questions? Okay. Uh, when, um, Representative Wilhite, when, when did the uh, governor get the budget? I understand he has a limited time to uh, respond once he actually officially gets it, right? I know he had it before, but. Well, as I understand, he still hasn't gotten the budget. Oh, really? Okay. Uh, he's supposed to get the budget. He, as I understand, right after session, he asked that the House and Senate not send him any of the legislation or the budget uh, and allow them, you know, the ample time and the focus on the pandemic in the state of Florida. As I understand, he's been getting bills slowly. Uh, he got quite a few more today. As I understand, he has, still has not got all of the pieces of legislation that were passed. And as far as I know or my staff has been told, he has not, not actually received the budget yet which is concerning because he's supposed to have 15 days to evaluate the budget before it goes into effect on July 1st. Uh, we're past 15 days, so I know that people have been talking about it, but I don't know that officially he has actually received it. Okay, thank you. Richard. Um, I just wanted to uh, thank you, Matt, for submitting a budget where the uh, State employees for the first time in a while actually got a cost of living increase. Do you think there's any uh, chance that's going to survive? Uh, he did mention he did mention in his comments that uh, obviously another big step in that budget is teacher increase in, in starting salary for teachers, six hundred fifty million dollars. So uh, that's a big thing, and I know that was something that was high on the priority list. And he did mention that obviously. Uh, the pay increases and, and uh, things like this were important. And, and as you know, I mean, every time that we give someone a, 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 a hopefully a pay raise, they reinvest it. And they put it back in their community and whether it's, you know, child care or food or purchasing something or whatever. So hopefully those things, as I say, you know, as long as we don't cut these, as long as he doesn't cut these things out of the budget, I think ultimately it ends up helping the state of Florida as well. No, thank you, you very much for all you're doing for us, Matt. Yeah, thank you, Representative Rollhart. We thank you for coming here tonight or vir <laughs> virtually being with us this evening. Um, continue uh, the good job you're doing uh, representing this, this area in, in, the, uh, in the legislature. And I don't think there are any other questions uh, unless you have anything else you want to share. We appreciate you being with us this evening. Well, I would just say I'm sorry. I, it took me a few minutes to figure out there's, there's so many different systems. Perfectly Google okay. And Zoom and now webinar and trying to figure it out on which computer. Okay. Stuff. I'm sorry I missed my allotment time in the, bus, in the agenda. But thank you again. If you need anything, please feel free to reach out to me or my staff or know that we're still here continuing to work uh, for you, your constituents, and the district and the entire state. So thank you very much, everyone, and thank you for what you're doing. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. We're going to go back now and complete our reports. I think, Ray, you are up. <clears throat> okay. The um, COVID-19 update I'll do first, and I got a, a question for you from the county. Uh, just to put things in perspective, the you know, there's still not a cure that's going to be around for at 
least 12 months. That's being optimistic. Uh, we're going to be social distancing until then. Uh, they're predicting, they're estimating that 4 to 7% of the population in Palm Beach County has gotten it. So this is not over. This, we've got a long ways to go. The idea of social distancing, the idea of wearing masks and the walking around others is, is, is important. The, um, the county did, has asked the state for Palm Beach County to move to phase two. They don't have an answer from that yet. Uh, we do have all of phase one implemented. That did allow us to entertain youth sports, um, open up all our parks, bless our playgrounds, our dog parks. Uh, our camp, summer camp, which we talked about earlier, and we do have open. We are obviously social distancing at using the CDC guidelines of nine children with one uh, counselor and keeping the group separate. The, um, <clears throat> what the county is looking to do is to require masks in buildings that accept the public. Any, any building that the public can, can enter into, your, publics, your public buildings, um, Home Depot, uh, they're looking at uh, – and I think they're going to be discussing this uh, at their next council meeting. I don't know if they're meeting Friday or not. I think they are to, to discuss it. And they were looking from the cities if we would support a, um, a mandatory uh, wearing of the masks in, in buildings that accept the public. So I, I kind of asked the council, would, would this council um, consider – they're looking at doing the, the order countywide. So, and if they do it countywide, it's – I mean, we have to follow it. We don't have a choice. A few, about a month ago, they did ask all the cities if uh, if the county had an order in unincorporated county portions of the county, would the cities want to voluntarily go on to that? <clears throat> and I, I, when that was asked, none of the cities agreed to do that. They're like, you know, if you're going to do an order that's just you, then you know we'll worry about doing our own orders um, if we see a need. The, this time they're they're asking differently. They're saying we want to do a countywide ordinate order in all the cities and in the unincorporated areas, and now and they're wanting to ask what cities would would uh, would support that order. So, well, before I take comments from council, I just want to put some other context around this. <clears throat> I'm sure all of you, I know I have gotten several uh, emails from citizens in the village who are concerned that they go into places where the public goes, for example, Publix, grocery store, Aldi's, um, <clears throat> uh, Walmart, and they're concerned because they felt that too many people were not adhering to wearing a mask. Now, I've spent time sp speaking to large groups, small groups, any, any way I, opportunity I have, and one of the key messages I'm sharing about wearing a mask is the, the, the science behind it is if I wear a mask, I protect you. Because if I'm infected and I don't know it, I can still spread it. But if I wear a mask, I significantly reduce the potential of me infecting you. So therefore, if I wear a mask, I protect you. If you wear a mask, you protect me. So we have mutual respect, protection for each other. That's the whole concept behind wearing a mask. I don't understand what all this pushback has been about wearing a mask. I don't know. I can't answer that. But it is important all right, for us to do that. Um, I just want to make another comment. I, I'm going to stop using the term social distancing. And I'm going to use the term survival distancing. Okay? Practicing this social distancing may be a pain in the neck for us. But unfortunately, those are the cards we are dealt right now. And to survive this pandemic and get to a point where hopefully they'll have a vaccine and we can protect ourselves by immunizing ourselves, we're gonna have to play by some rules that may be uncomfortable sometimes. So I really, I'm, I'm looking at this as, as about survival because I see the numbers from Dr. Alonzo, I'm just appalled. The numbers are going up. They're worse than they ever were for us, all right? There's no abatement. The numbers are higher. We have hit new highs than we have ever hit through this whole pandemic here in Palm Beach County. I'm not talking about the whole state, I'm talking about right here in our community. So this is it's very real, nothing's been cured. But we need to go through reopening because we, try, we need to try to mend the economy and, and it's important for people to have an opportunity to go back to work so they can take care of their families. So in doing that, we just have to be super smart. So I just wanna put that comment, that context there. And as I said, 
I don't know about you, I've gotten these, these frustrating emails from members in our, in our village, and basically the emails say, asking Tane Mayor, you know, put this in effect and make everybody wear a mask. Here's the reality about putting the rule in effect for requiring a mask. <clears throat> and I talked about this with the village manager. It comes down to, my first question is, how do we enforce this? Okay? Now, you've heard me say many times, our number one priority in the village is what? We want it to be a safe place to live. And for that to be accomplished, our police officers have to be focused on making sure it's a safe place to live. I don't want to divert manpower from our police resources going and telling people they got to wear a mask. All right? That's the dichotomy. Village manager says we do have uh, um, a, a code enforcement team, but that team is certainly not adequate, all right? Believe me, because if this rule goes in, we're going to get more reports about people, violations, and not wearing a mask. So here's my thought on this to the county. If your county wants to pass this rule, make the, the burden of enforcement should be on the people who own or operate these places where the public comes in. I've had several conversations with managers of the area stores because I go in there and I see people walking around out of masks and I call them over and I says, hey, you know, why are you allowing people into your store or into your property without wearing a mask? And they would give me an answer. Well, their corporate said this and they said that. And I says, do you understand that you have the authority based on the state of emergency we're operating under now that you can tell people if you come into the store, you have to wear a mask. Now, they already enforce, they, they do enforce the fact that they limit how many people they let into the store or into the place at a, at a time. So why not go to the next step and say, if you don't come in, if you don't wear a mask, you can't come in. So if the county wants to pass this rule, I will ask that they structure it in a way where the burden of enforcement is on the places where the public is going into. So if there's a violation that's occurring, then that proprietor or the owners of these, of these facilities are accountable for that, as opposed to us trying to do it on an individual basis and trying to find individual citizens. So that's my thought on that, and that was the thought I shared with the village manager. I open up for comments from members of the council. I think you were first, Jeff. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, it, it, it's interesting to watch the voluntary uh, impact and, and effectiveness. I mean, we we did do a really great job in two or three months. We went to an extreme, certainly, but most of the success was due to our, our individual decision. Um, it, my preference would be a voluntary execution or implementation of this kind of a thing, uh, some kind of incentive that would, would motivate businesses to, to do what you just said. Now, there's two kinds of incentives. One's a positive and the other's a negative. You just offered one version of that. Um, but holding the businesses responsible is certainly one way to go. Um, reminding them that, well, as you said, the mask is not about me. The mask is about you. Well, the you happens to be their employee. The you happens to be their customers. I don't know about you all, but I know when I go into a place and nobody's got a mask on, Get out of there. typically, unless I have to be there, I'm, I'm going to leave. And And... And so people will vote with their feet, as they say. Um, <laughs> and I think businesses are aware of that. And, and consequently, I think it's a matter of perhaps just reminding them, encouraging them, uh, reminding them that this, this uh, coronavirus has not passed. And the numbers are showing a, an increase in certain areas, some key areas like positivity and things of that nature. And, and so um, we need to continue doing what we had done before without the lockdown just doing the social distancing, doing the, doing the wearing of masks uh, on a voluntary basis. And that, I've been in a number of stores, I'm sure you have too. You walk up, uh, no shoes, no shirt, no <laughs> mask, no service. I keep your sense of humor, not bad. Bottom line is there are people, there are stores, shops, restaurants doing just that. And, um, and it's... Um, it's my preferred approach to doing this because the, imp the enforcement becomes a real challenge, just like you're describing. So um, that's, that's my thought on it. So, that's what you, so your, your thought is you'd rather not see the county invoke this 
But if they do, you, do you support the notion that the enforcement should so be on the so proprietors? So one of one of the things, the, the idea of your your notion of enforcement, I think I think makes sense. Um, uh, they asked us, would we support it? There are two options that I think are implied by that, support or oppose. Interestingly enough, one of the lessons I've learned from the League of Cities is a third option. What's that? No objection. Hmm. What does that mean? What that means is you we would do nothing to get in the way of that. You, do the, you don't deny or I, confirm. <laughs> we would not take a position that would get, get in the way of that. Well, and then it becomes a matter of implementation. But here's, here's, here's my concern with that. I don't want the county dictating a rule now and, and putting an, an ordinance in place that it's going to cost us, all right? It's going to cost our village the, the distraction of forcing us to use our police resources to police this. I don't want to operate under a mandate that's going to force us to do that. When I, to me, I'm saying again, to me, if you're going to do this, put the burden on, on the proprietors. So They asked us our opinion, and that can be some of the feedback. Okay. Is, is that the county's response? Is that our lo local law enforcement would enforce So for this all policy? the orders that they've done so far have been second degree misdemeanors, so that, that's where that would fall. I don't see that being any different. The only thing, you know, you can either do it on, on the person, which would be like second degree misdemeanor, or a property owner, which would be code enforcement, but that would be very difficult much more difficult to deal with. Enforcement of this is, is going to, everybody knows enforcement of this is going to be very difficult. What what the deal is, is we know there's a, a, a group of people that will always wear masks. There's a group of people that won't wear masks. And then there's everybody in the middle. If an order like this was put out, more people in the middle would wear masks. More businesses would be, would be requiring it. Therefore, more people would be wearing masks and there'd be less spread. That's it. It's all about slowing the spread down. We're only at seven percent, four to seven percent of the population has had it. We don't reach herd immunity until we're at eighty percent, or we have a vaccine. So it's all about keeping that keeping that curve down. So, any other comments? I don't, yeah, I don't. I'm supportive. I'm supportive of masks, but the the notion that we have to somehow police this. Um, makes my head spin. Problematic, yeah. Who was next? Yeah. Okay. Well, I can tell you, I, I can answer one of your first questions. Um, I hate wearing these masks. They're, they're difficult and uncomfortable, and it's difficult for me to breathe sometimes. So that's why I think some people might not wear them. But at the end of the day, it's a public safety issue. I don't like getting shots at the doctor either, but you go and get them because not only is it better for you, it's better for other people who won't get sick. So I... I definitely support the idea of, you know, the ordinance as far as the masks go. Um, what I don't support is, as the mayor and several others have said, is, you, you know, this isn't a, a misdemeanor. No. I mean, this isn't something I want um, law enforcement going in. And, you know, I would think most of them are notices to appear, but you don't want to see people getting arrested, especially at this time. I, I mean, that doesn't make sense. If anything, I would think uh, – Code enforcement, as you said, it isn't really an option like uh, the mayor indicated. It's not something we're going to be able to keep up with, but maybe something that law enforcement can give a ticket for. And as far as the, the property owners, I mean, it'd be nice if they could do that, but the public isn't the police. I mean, the bottom line is if someone comes in without a mask, what are we going to have the bag boys wrestle them and grab them out of the place? Of course not. We don't want to do that. Um, so that's a little unreasonable, but my... My thoughts are yes. I think we should support the county's ordinance. I order or order. It'd be an order. Okay, it's part so of support it. the county's order, but definitely, if uh, for me, if it's a second degree misdemeanor, we're we're going to arrest people. I'm I'm not with that. I'm not, I'm out if if that's what they're going to do. Um, enforcement's going to be an issue, as the manager said. And uh, but I do think there's a lot of utility in. I'm one of those people. If they say hey, like with the masks, when they said hey, you got to wear a mask into the store. I started wearing a mask into the store. No matter much how much I hated it, we complied. I complied. And I, and I think there's a lot of people out there that will be in that camp that aren't wearing masks now because guess what? Push comes to shove. I don't have to, so I'm not going to. But now they're saying I have to, so I will. So 
those are my thoughts. Thank you, Ms. Hester. Uh, I actually agree with everything that you had said in your explanation, and it, it's a lot going back and forth to it. Um, very similar to what everybody else had said, it's civil liberty over public interest or safety. And I don't think we should dictate that they have to wear them. I've gone into plenty of businesses in the village and throughout the county, and they say, sorry, our policy is you have to wear a mask to enter. No problem, here's my mask and do it. So yes, it is very easy though to monitor it. Um, I think police, not just our sheriff's office, but police stations throughout the country have quite a bit going on right now. And if they're dealing with protesters and rioters, are they gonna be called into Publix because grandma's not wearing a mask? It's, you know, putting on there. So I, my personal feeling is you do what, what's best for you. I think the businesses should, if their policy is you don't wear a mask, you're not entitled, you're not gonna come into our establishment. And then you just don't go in there. You know, Amazon's making a killing with home deliveries. So let's be honest, you can, you can go through life without it for a while, um, but I don't think that we should tax our police department with that in addition to it as well. Okay, I, I think what I've heard is somewhat of a consensus that, yeah, we support the concept, but we are not willing and comfortable with having to put this on our police and we don't want to see individual, you know, take it or, which, by de facto, then, if we're then saying, with that being in mind, by de facto, we're really backing into the notion of, if the county's going to do it, put the burden of enforcement on the establishments. Mm -hmm. What I'll relate to them is we're, we're in favor of an order, not in favor of making a second degree misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. Well, what could be the problem? The fact that we should right. specifically say, yeah, but don't leave, the, don't leave it to question unanswered. We're saying there has to be, is it, this, there's no sense in putting any ordinance or, or rules in place if you don't have a, a plan on how you're going to enforce it. So the enforcement issue has to be addressed right up front. And I think we should say, put the burden on the establishments. Okay. okay. Well, go, if, if we want to go down that route, what we can do is, you know, if this is something that the public says, no one enters without a mask, and someone enters with a mask, without and then they mask. come up and say, well, if someone goes in and they don't let them in, what do you do? Then you call the police, and then it's a trespass, and then they take care of it that way. Well, a lot as of opposed to a lot you know, of letting places. people just go in and with a mask. I mean, if, if you're if the property owner asks you to leave, and there's a reason because we have an ordinance that says you have a mask, you don't wear the mask, you need to go. And if the guy doesn't go, then I would say that's a reasonable point to bring law enforcement into it. But the the how the the, 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 the question you raise is a valid question. But I think the answer is more in the area of different establishments may handle it differently. Certain establishments have their own security in place. They got people walking around in, in plain clothes, but they're really, you know, security, looking out for things going on. I know they do at Walmart. So, but, so how the establishment wants to handle that, it, we, we need to leave that up to them. The point is, it's theirs to handle. If, they're, if they open their doors, and they're telling you, you know, you can't come around a mask or we only allow X number of people at a time, that's their operation. That's their decision on how they want to handle that particular situation. And each of them, I, th I think, have their own protocols today on how they handle uh, unusual situations that occur. They would have to just, you know, put that into their, into their uh, basket of, of, of solutions on how they do that. So I will relay the message. That, that's all I have. That's it? That's enough. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> it's Keith. Are you out there? Yeah, we have him here. Let's turn him on. Hello, Mayor Council. Can you hear me? Okay. We're not passing anything, though. It's the county. It's not, it's not us. Go ahead, Keith. We can hear you. Thank yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just very briefly, and along the lines of additional corona-related updates, uh, as things stand right now, the current executive orders uh, continue to allow this type of virtual meeting through the end of the month uh, until June 30th, uh, unless there is an additional extension 
uh, through a, a subsequent executive order from the governor. So uh, we're keeping our eye on that, and um, we'll uh, keep the village posted on either an, another extension or a termination of this process at the end of the month. Um, and I'll leave my report at that for tonight, unless you have any questions. Yes, Keith. Um, what's your reading of the situation? Do you is the is the thinking that there will be an extension, or there will be a modification of the current rule? I, su I suspect, um, given the way things are going, it will either be extended completely as it stands, or at the very least, it will be. Um, the, the piece that allows public participation through uh, remote access would at least be extended even if the, the physical quorum is not. So I think it's either all going to be extended or at the very least public participation will continue uh, given, given the numbers, the way they're trending and, and uh, so forth. Okay. Uh Ray, do you have any any uh, uh, information on how some of other cities have been handling this? And I, you know, for example, I know the county commissioners are meeting again as they had before, but they do have the the the, the distancing in terms of where people are sitting in the audience. And but they have these. I don't get, you guys have seen these. They got these petitions up between them each. Other. <laughs> what, what, what do you guys think about that? <laughs> I guess, I guess it depends on uh, how you feel about the uh, uh, separation being adequate and uh, the direction of most of our comments, even though I'm looking at you right now, being uh, other than left and right kind of a thing. So, I mean, there is a certain degree of, of, um, of buffer that we have there and a certain degree of protection. I, it's, it's interesting uh, because even some of the county commissioners still wear their masks, even inside the yeah, glass booth. Yes, so they do, yeah. I mean, this this is complicated. Good word. Any, any other thoughts on it? Yeah, my my take is um, I feel that we're distanced enough, and okay. I don't think masks are necessary. However, if I think that we have to hear mm, petitions, partitions, or masks, and for that matter, because I think we're far enough apart okay. while we're sitting up here, as the manager said, if we get up and walk out there, I, I think we definitely up. should. But okay. If anyone up here is uncomfortable with that, then I think we should all that's indulge what I'm that um, request and everybody then wear masks. That's what I'm asking, how you guys feel about it. Uh, as a hurricane, I'm sitting in between a knoll and a gator. Some more partitions would be greatly appreciated. Really? <laughs> we're going to put that on, the t on, the, on top of everything else. Okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> Yours is the penalty box. You know, I think the more we can protect ourselves, the better. It's fine. Um, and and I think we should have branded village. We should have what? We should have branded. Oh, that's masks. right. This is, a good, this is a good time to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> is that a formal request? You got that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think what I'm hearing is, uh, and Keith, um, I'm, I'm getting back to you as well. Um, there's a fair chance that the the order would be extended but modified and modify it in a way where uh, we would, we in this particular uh, council would have the option of continuing to do what we're doing now and, um, and as, as well as we have the distancing. The question becomes, Ray, I think, um, staff, all right? How do we handle uh, staff? Because that distancing wouldn't be available for the normal staff that would normally be here. Well, what we're doing, in, in our, all of our public buildings is when you're when you're out of your desk and walking around you have to wear a mask in any of the public areas or anything like that uh, and then in, when you go into someone else's office to meet if everybody in that meeting is comfortable with the mask off they can take the mask off and that's after you've you've, you've assured you got the social distance so we are practicing that in all of our buildings and all of our practices um, so we, we're following the CDC guidelines we feel we, we feel we're, we're following them to the to the letter. Okay. We do walk out sometimes without and forget our masks, so we're hanging them up on the door like we're on our way 
and I'm worried. <laughs> you get like halfway down the hallway and you're like, damn, I don't walk back. Okay. I, it's funny. I had the, the other day I was at the, uh, public and I, 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 I was coming out, I had my mask on, and a lady was coming in. And when she looked at me, she said, oh, she forgot her mask in the car. So she ran back to get her mask in the car. We're, so, we're getting a lot better. Yeah. We're getting better at it. <laughs> Um, okay, Keith, uh, when do you think we'll get some update on this? Uh-oh. Is Keith still there? He is. He self-muted. Unmute. Oh, he's on. There he goes. He's unmuted. Keith, can you hear me? There, I, I see I you. Yeah, I was asking. Okay. You heard yeah. the conversation so, we just had. Today's the 18th. That gives you about two weeks. Yes. I, I, unfortunately, my guess is that that we'll find out closer to the thirtieth than we'd like, okay. and probably won't have as much advance time as we would like. Um, we should just prepare a, 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 a plan scenario. If in fact some modification comes, would be. We'll, you know, we'll be kind of ready to position to, to try to accommodate that. Okay. Thanks, Keith. There's a delay. Did you hear me? Okay. We're good. <laughs> I think that concludes. Yeah. I think that concludes our reports for this evening. Moving right along. Uh, is there anyone here who has a petition to present to the council? Now would be the time. Seeing none, I'm closing um, acceptance of petitions. And now we have statements from the public on non-agenda items or items on a consent agenda. And I do have a card here for a non-agenda item. Former Councilman David Swift, come on up. Oh, come on back. I'm sorry. I'm used to saying come up to these speakers up here. I just have uh, two comments. Um, uh, this is long overdue. I, I meant to come here about three or four months ago, but because of the COVID-19 issues, I didn't. But basically, uh, I'm handing a, a, a picture out of what um, – I'm at uh, – of. Uh, I've had a lot of free time, and uh, <laughs> I've been <laughs> I've been fishing in our canals with uh, three other guys, and uh, I just wanted to comment on the villages uh, um, uh, program. They had uh, uh, the aquatic weed program last time I was here. I was very critical of it. I I took Paul uh, to task on that, and I just want to say I think the village has done a very good job in aquatic. Uh, maintenance of our canals this, this last winter and early this spring, and I, I hope you continue that program. I brought the, the fishing picture around from the f- standpoint that uh, it is a very good fishery out there. There's some big fish, and the more important is there's lots and lots of, of small fish that will grow up to be big fish, and the aquatic weed program has not seemed to uh, affect that in one way or another. I was very concerned that if you kill a whole bunch of weeds, you're going to take all the oxygen out of the water because they're de- decomposing and you're not going to get very f- uh, good fishing. But uh, it's excellent fishing here. And uh, I've caught three fish that size. Uh, I, I didn't go to Lake Okeechobee anymore. So <laughs> you, caught, you caught that here in the village? I caught that fish that they're right behind um, uh, Greenway. Wow. So, uh, and uh, anyway. Now, now the word is out. Yeah, no right, right. Everybody's going to be out there. And uh, we have a lot of exotic fishes in our canal that people are catching and et cetera. So, anyway, so that's a good news thing. The second thing I, I, w- I wanted to talk about, and uh, th- this comes up every 4th of July, and I understand you may not be doing the 4th of July fireworks. As a dog owner, one of thousands, thousands of dog owners that live in the village, we're happy. Because our dogs uh, basically are miserable for the <laughs> from uh, it's not just July July Fourth. We get firecrackers and and grenade launchers or whatever they they throw out out there. It actually shakes our windows. Uh, uh, July first, July second, July third, July fourth, July fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth. 
Yes. And the village, obviously, uh, we don't do a lot about that. The, there's a lot of personal stuff. I really wish you'd take a look at Wellington's ordinance and look. I don't have a problem with shooting fireworks off at the anywhere in the village on July 4th. You want to do that, but f the first, second, third, fourth, or third, <laughs> fourth's okay, but fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, that really continue. affects dog right. owners. Okay. And uh, uh, I'd like to take a look at it. I know that Wellington has uh, initiated ordinance out there. I don't know how well it's working, but uh, I really think it's time to consider it. Let's talk politics for a moment. There's thousands of dog owners. <laughs> There's a handful of people in this town that shoot fireworks out of, in, in their front yards. Let's see, dog uh, owners. Come away that a little bit the next time, okay? <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just, a, just a note, Ray, I don't know, we might have had a conversation with um, uh, your counterpart in Wellington and just to kind of get a read on, you know, tell them that somebody was bragging about their ordinance and we want to get more information about it. Thank you, sir. Okay. I have no other comment cards uh, submitted for non-agenda items or any comment cards for items on a consent agenda. But as always, if anyone here would like to make a non-agenda comment or would like to make a comment on the consent agenda. No, the consent agenda. We didn't get there yet. We'll get there. Okay, seeing none, then I'm closing public comment on non-agenda items and on a consent agenda. And with that, Diane, can you give us a consent agenda? Yes, Mayor Arnold. Number one, finance is requesting ratification of an emergency procurement for the purchase of three thermal body temperature systems at a cost of $27,645 each. The work is to be procured and completed in accordance with Village Code Section 10-98B, Emergency Procurements. We have solicited three quotes for this work, and the low quote is from Vetted Security Solu Solutions. Two, adoption of resolution number 2010, a resolution of the Village Council of the Village of Royal Palm Beach, Florida, adopting a revised schedule of fees and charges, specifically repealing resolution 1938, providing that this schedule of fees and charges shall be available for inspection at all times at the Village Hall during regular business hours providing an effective date and for other purposes. And three, approval and authorization for the mayor to enter into a right-of-way consent agreement between the Village of Royal Palm Beach and Florida Power and Light Company. Okay. Um, there are no uh, comments from members on council. Well, actually, may I pull consent agenda yeah. item number one, please? Good. I was going to ask you to do that. Thank you. <laughs> So no further comments from members on council. I'll look for a motion. I make a motion to approve consent agenda items two and three. Second. And we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Diane, please let the record show that consent agenda items uh, two and three were approved. Five zero. And since you asked for it. Yeah. Mr. Manager, if you could please just give us a quick synopsis of what you're purchasing and where they're going to go. So what we're purchasing is three computers and infrared cameras, and and they'll be digital cameras too. And it's a device that goes will go at the doorway to the rec center, the cultural center, and the police department. And what it does is it, it measures everybody's temperature as they walk in that building. If their temperature is over, I believe it's 100.4, then it'll take a, a picture of them, and it'll send it to the, the front desk and say this person's got a, a temperature over 100.4, and then we'll ask that person to to leave the building. Uh, we're at the rec center, that's where we have most of the people coming in and out on, on a regular basis, more people than any of our other buildings. The cultural center, uh, we will. It, we don't have as much staff there, but when we start renting it out again, uh, it'll be able to protect the, the people that are renting the facility. So uh, are the police department will, will have them there. Are these units mobile so for instance when we do start doing the larger events at the cultural center can we take the one from the rec center and put it over there to help speed up people going i don't in know and out? how mobile they i know they're okay. installed and they're and they're, they're and they're wired yeah. in and everything and they they're and they're on you know they're connected to their to our network and all that so i mean i don't think it's a, it's not something we can easily move around from place it to would, place yeah it would, i did when i looked at this earlier in a week i looked into this a little bit it, it's not it wasn't designed really to do that I'm not saying that you can't but it's probably not a practice you want to do. Uh, 
did we look into the possibility of, of ordering a, another unit for the cultural center? Well, this is the maximum amount. we do. Yeah, we're doing it at the cultural center, the uh, parks uh, recreation building, and the police department. So we do have one for the cultural center. Oh, we do? We are yes. covered at the cultural center. Yes. Okay. Go well, ahead. my question was, is, as we do events, we're starting to go through. If you have 100 people going into an event and only one door they can all enter into, could we possibly put up a set? That's what it's asking. I, I, I see what affordable you. in that sense. Well, that would be a lovely problem to have. But <laughs> Some of our events that we do have at the cultural center, especially we're, weddings and gatherings and, and our local stuff, we well, do. Here's the real question. And the funding for this comes from where? It's an FDLE grant. <laughs> it's other like people's money. Other people's money. <laughs> okay. OPM. Okay. It's all your money in the long run, but. Any, any other questions on this item one? I was going to ask a question to that about oh, funding. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do have a follow-up on that. So there's COVID money available. This is not the COVID money. Uh, Chris Marsh has, has been working with the county in, in, in that end of things, and there's there's more restrictions on that as far as getting that. Um, there were less restrictions on this. Okay. Thank you. Jan? I make a motion to approve regular consent. I'm sorry, consent agenda item number one. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We have no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that consent agenda item number one was approved 5 0. Any timeline on when these will be up and operational? Okay. How are we for the sooner the better? That's good then. Okay. Um, now we will move to the regular agenda. <coughs> and regular agenda item number one is a public hearing to consider application 19-0086, an application by <laughs> Urban Design Kill Day Studios, and resolution 20-11, confirming <laughs> council action. Someone talking? Is that Keith David? I'm, I'm here. I'll get in when, uh, the oh, okay. The applicant is seeking a site plan modification in order to modify the existing Lowy's Shopping Center ingress egress access driveway for approximately 31.91 acres uh, located at 103 South State Road 7 and situated within the general commercial zoning district. Uh, this is a quasi-judicial uh, process, so the people who want to participate have to be sworn in. Keith, you're on. Yes, sir. Are the applicants present, or are they virtual? Uh, uh, good afternoon. Good evening. This is Jeff Evans, and I am I'm virtual. I am representing the applicant. All right, thank you, Mr. Evans. So if you could raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm under penalties of perjury that your testimony to the village council will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And, Mayor, I just need to ask council if anyone has had any ex parte discussions regarding this matter, and those would need to be disclosed on the record at this time. I have none. Does Bradford have to be sworn in? If there's a, yeah, the staff, uh, Bradford, that needs to be uh, sworn in if you speak it. Bradford, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear me? Thank you, Bradford. Do you swear or affirm under penalties of perjury that your testimony to the village council will be the truth and nothing but the truth? Yes. Okay, thank, thank you, Mayor. We can proceed. Thank you, Keith. Bradford, you're on. Thank you, sir. Um, if I can get control, so I can pull up my presentation. My hands are off. <laughs> <laughs> we got your picture of the, the, the Okay, I hope that site. you can see my presentation. Okay, yes, it's I'll, up. I'll go ahead and start my presentation. The applicant is seeking a site plan modification. Approval in order to modify the existing Lowe's Shopping Center ingress-egress driveway for a property located at 103rd South State Road 7 and situated on a 31.91 site located within the Lowe's planned commercial development. This area is the east 
easternmost section of Erica Boulevard providing interactivity to the Total Royale Master Plan, Post Shopping Center, and the development to the south. Modification is also designed to align with the proposed new signalized intersection at the southernmost entrance of Lowe's Shopping Center. This access point will line, line up with the Home Depot El Dorado Plaza on the east side of State Road 7. In reviewing the site plan modification application, general staff considered conformity with the Village of Royal Palm Beach zoning code pertaining to the general commercial zoning district. The original site plan met all general commercial zoning district standards and the proposed modification to the existing Lowe's Shopping Center ingress egress access drive also complies with these standards. This item was considered by the Planning and Zoning Commission at its regular meeting on June 9, 2020 and recommended approval by a vote of 5 to 0. Village so staff is recommending approval of this application. Uh, and with that being said, Mayor, I'll turn the floor back over to you and also my screen. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Bradford. Um, before we take comments from uh, members on council, uh, I would take, like to take comments from the public. But before I take public comment from members of the public present here and on the line tonight, uh, in the notice Here. of the electric electronic meeting members of the public, we encouraged them to provide a public comment to the village clerk prior to the meeting. So we did let people know that they, didn't, they could, a week ago, sent in their comments to the village clerk um, and not have to worry about being in attendance or being on the call, the comments would be heard and read to the record. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to confirm with the village clerk whether or not we received any comments in advance for agenda item R1. I have received no um, comments for agenda item number one. Okay. Um, I have not received any comment cards from anyone here for agenda item R1, but if someone would like to comment, I would like to give you that opportunity. Agenda item R1. Okay, seeing, if you want to comment, you have to go to the, They have to meet the same water retention rules as anybody in commercial property. In, in Hold the yeah, we, we need to have your name and address, sir, before name you... Name is Robert Boyd, the 231 Cypress Trace, um, uh, your estates. The answer is yes. Yes, they do. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyone else would like to comment on agenda item R1? Seeing none, then I'm closing public comment to agenda item R1 and open for comments from members on council. If there are no comments from members on council, I'll look for a motion. Motion to approve regular agenda item R1. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We have no opposed. I am pleased to let the record show that agenda item R1 was approved 5-0. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, the applicant. Thank you very much. Jeff, did you, did, I'm sorry, did you want to make comments? I, I have about an hour and a half presentation if you would like me to go through it with you. <laughs> okay. Otherwise, uh, no, thank you very much. I'd okay. like to thank uh, staff and, and thank the council for uh, your consideration this evening. Thank you. Okay. All right, now we move to agenda item R2, which is a public hearing for the first reading an approval of ordinance number 1003, approving application number 19-120, an application by Jess R. Santa Maria seeking a change of land use designation for four parcels of land totaling approximately 12.28 acres from the village's commercial land use designation to the village's multifamily low density uh, utilization. Located approximately 850 feet north Okeechobee Boulevard, approximately 500 feet west of Royal Palm Beach Boulevard. And with that, Bradford, you're on. Great. Thank you again, Mayor. Let me see if I can share my screen. Still says Lowe's. Can everybody see my presentation? Yes. Yes. 
Okay, great. The applicant is seeking a site plan modification approval in order to modify the existing Lowe's shopping center. Oh, I'm sorry. Turn the page. The applicant is seeking a large scale future land use map amendment to change the land use designation for four parcels of land totaling 12.28 acres of land from commercial land use designation to multifamily low density residential land use designation. The site is currently vacant land. The applicant has indicated in the justification statement that the ultimate goal is to develop the property for 100 townhouse dwelling units. That would equate to approximately 8.14 units per acre. In reviewing the proposed future land use map amendment designation, the parcels as multifamily low density, the which staff consider compatibility with adjacent land uses, consistency with the village's comprehensive plan, whether the action requested will exacerbate any existing public facility capacity deficits in regards to roadway, network, sanitary sewer, solid waste, <clears throat> drainage, potable water, and recreation and open space. Um, traffic circulation element and traffic impact analysis has been undertaken for the site to determine compliance with the county's traffic performance standards. A CPSO letter dated October 22nd, 2019 was issued by Palm Beach County stating that the proposed development for 120 or 110 dwelling units meets the county's traffic performance standards ordinance. The development meets the sanitary sewer and solid waste requirements, drainage and recreation and open space. Um, and as far as the school concurrency, the applicant has provided a school capacity availability determination dated November 15, 2019, which concludes that, quote, there will be a negative impact on the school systems, and if the Village Council approves the amendment, they, re they recommend in order to address the school capacity deficit generated by this proposed development at the high school level, the property owner shall contribute $166,688 to the school district of Palm Beach County prior to the issuance of the first building permit. Uh, the proposed land use amendment package is consistent with the requirements of Chapter 163 of Florida Statute. Staff is recommending denial of the proposed future land use map amendment from the village's commercial land use designation to the multifamily low density land, land use designation because the proposed residential use is in, incompatible with the existing commercial uses immediately adjacent to the development site. Village's comprehensive plan outlines a goal for a mix of use, mix of compatible uses, which meets the needs of the village residents, maintains and enhances community character, does not adversely impact the existing neighborhood, and it is um, developed currently with the needed infrastructure and facilities as seen in goal LU1. And an and objective that the village shall ensure that new development and redevelopment is consistent with and does not neg negatively impact existing neighborhoods and uses, and that existing uses and neighborhoods are maintained in a manner that does not diminish community character or neg negatively impact the surrounding areas and objective LU 1.10. And further adding a policy that new development should continue to be compatible with the with and complementary to surrounding land uses and should not negatively affect existing approval activities in policy IC 1.2.2. And similar to the village's comprehensive plan requirements for compatibility, section 163.3164 parens 9 Florida statute defines compatibility as, quote, a condition in which land uses or conditions can coexist in relative proximity to each other in a stable fashion over time such that, such that no use or condition is unduly negatively impacted directly or indirectly by another use or condition. In addressing the compatibility of this development with the adjacent properties, the applicant describes how the proposed development is compatible with the existing residential neighborhoods across the M1 Canal water body to the north and to the west of the property and staff generally agrees with that assessment. However, the justification statement fails to mention or address how the proposed residential land use is compatible with the existing commercial uses that are immediately adjacent to and surrounding a large portion of the proposed development site. 
For reviewing the proposed land use map amendment, staff has identified the incompatibility deficiencies with the proposal and are offered in support of staff's recommendation of denial. One of those being the proposed future land use map amendment fails to identify how the residential use will be sufficiently buffered from the existing commercial uses. Policy H-1.1.4 of the village's comprehensive plan provides that the village shall require the use of landscaping or other buffers between residential areas and major arterial or more intensive land use. Policy LU-1.7.2 further provides that regulations for buffering and compatible land uses shall be set forth in the village's land development regulations. In accordance with the village's comprehensive plan, section 15-1 prints I of the village's landscape code seeks to utilize vegetation to promote compatibility of otherwise incompatible land uses in close proximity. Village code section 15-1 prints I promotes the idea that buffering improves compatibility of otherwise incompatible land uses, in particular residential adjacent to commercial. Therefore, per village code, residential developments adjacent to commercial developments are inherently incompatible, but that compatibility may be improved through sufficient buffering of residential development. In other words, establishing incompatible incompatibility buffers will help protect the resident, residential use from the more intense commercial use by creating a separation between the two. Commercial developments that are separated with a residential area by a buffer will not eliminate the incompatibility entirely, but may be considered less intrusive than commercial development that directly affect the residential area without a buffer or a or significantly reduced buffer. In this case, Village Code Section 15-131B1 requires that commercial buffers located adjacent to residential uses have a perimeter landscape buffer along the entire abutting property line, and such buffer shall be a minimum of 25 feet in width. Additionally, Village Code 2684, parens 4, parens E, 4 requires a second minimum 25 foot buffer be installed on the residential property where board borders the non residential use. Reading these two sections together, Village Code intended for the burden of the 50 foot perimeter landscape buffer to address incompatibility issues be shared between the commercial and the residential property owners with 25 feet to be installed on each side. <clears throat> Waterway Plaza, however, was developed as a single commercial property and was not originally designed to have a residential use adjacent to it. As a result, no 25-foot landscape buffer was ever installed along the borders of the proposed residential development. Therefore, the entire, entirety of the 50-foot landscape buffer will need to be installed on the proposed residential property in order to meet the village comprehensive plan and village code's compatibility threshold. In addressing policy H-1.1.4, the applicant says it only intends to install a 25-foot buffer along the south and east, proper, east property lines of the existing commercial uses in lieu of the 50-foot required. Additionally, the applicant has failed to identify how it will satisfy uh, the 50-foot buffer requirements along the entrance drive into the residential development since the entire entrance drive is bounded on the north and south sides by commercial uses. The roadway is existing and is only 50 feet wide, meaning there is ins insufficient width to meet these requirements. The applicant has in indicated that it intends to request a waiver to section 15 one thirty-one b prints b prints 1 and a variance to section 26 84 4E4. The proposed future land use map amendment fails to identify how it does not negatively impact the existing commercial uses. As stated prior, objective LU 1.10 of the village's comprehensive plan requires that the village ensure new development does not negatively impact existing uses. Similarly to section 163.3164 parens 9 of Florida statute, provides that a use is not compatible if it unduly negatively impacts other uses either directly or indirectly. The applicant's proposed land use map amendment seeks to remove a portion of the entrance drive to existing, existing waterway shopping center, change the land use of that portion from the commercial to the residential, and incorporate said portion into the proposed residential development. This proposed proposal effects effectively cuts off tracks 
C1 and C2 of the Waterway Plaza plat for the remainder of the shopping center. Those are the property south of the entrance drive. This proposal not only unduly negatively impacts track C1 and C2, but the other commercial tracks within the Waterway Plaza shopping center. For example, the existing commercial uses were constructed in reliance on a shared use entrance drive into the shopping center remaining a commercial land use and the proposed residential project site remaining a commercial land use. If the proposed land use map amendment is approved and the applicant fails to provide for the required 50 foot buffer along any of the residential perimeter boundary lines and along the entrance drive boundary lines, then the burden of installing those buffers will fall to the commercial property owner if and when they seek a site plan modification. Accommodating such buffers on the existing commercial sites may result in a loss of parking spaces and or loss of development, developable land. In essence, approving the proposed land use map amendment and the variance of waivers for buffering will automatically make the existing commercial properties non-conforming with respect to the village's buffering requirement. Village staff cannot recommend approval of land use change to residential when such change will impact existing commercial uses in this manner. On another note, there is an existing shopping center sign on the uh, Waterway Plaza shopping center track C2, the shopping, shopping center sign exists pursuant uh, to a private easement between Jeff Santa Maria and the owner of track C2. For the easement, the fourth and fifth spaces at the bottom of the sign are reserved for the business located on track C of Waterway Plaza. If the proposed land use map amendment is approved, the entrance drive bifurcates track C1 and C2 from the remainder of the Waterway Plaza shopping center, then the shopping center sign located on track C2 will become an off-premise sign respect to the Waterway Plaza Shopping Center owner tenants to the south of the entrance drive. It may also become an off-premise sign for the commercial owner tenants on track C1 to the north, depending on how that site is developed. Off-site off -site signs are prohibited and variances are not or cannot be sought for prohibited signs. Uh, the applicant has wholly failed to address how the transformation of the currently permitted shopping center sign into a prohibited off-premise sign does not unduly negatively impact the existing commercial owners, tenants in the Waterway Plaza that currently utilize that sign for business identification purposes. Again, village staff cannot recommend approval of land use change to residential when such, a, when such change will impact existing commercial uses in this way. Furthermore, policy T-1.1.3 of the Village's Comprehensive Plan requires that the Village review access points and driveways associated with development for safety and compatibility with the existing and future roadway network. Additionally, Objective T-3.1 of the Village's Comprehensive Plan requires that the Village review all development applications for consistency with the transportation system to appropriately accommodate bicycle and pedestrian roadway design and facility requirements. The applicant has failed to address, it, how, address how it will be able to provide sidewalks and bike lanes within the existing entrance drive and still meet village roadway design requirements. This may create a safety concern for the residents seeking to walk or ride their bikes either to the Waterway Plaza Shopping Center or out to Royal Palm Beach Boulevard. This problem is exacerbated by the fact that commercial vehicle traffic is not going to be prohibited from continuing to use the existing entrance drive into the commercial shopping area, thereby resulting in the encroachment of commercial traffic onto a local residential road and encroachment of an incompatible use into a residential area. For these reasons, against village staff cannot recommend approval of land use change to residential when safety of future village residents is not being adequately addressed. Uh, we have received a letter from the owner of the Village Royale Shopping Center expressing support of this amendment. The local planning agency will hear this request at the regular meeting on June 23rd, 2020. Now for those two words everyone has been waiting for, in conclusion, staff is recommending denial of application number 19120 CPA and ordinance 1003, given that the proposed future land use map amendment is incompatible with the adjacent commercial uses. The proposed amendment fails to identify identify how the resident, residential use will be sufficiently buffered from the existing commercial uses, fails to identify how it will not negatively impact the existing commercial uses, and fails to identify how it will protect the health, safety, and welfare of pedestrians and bicyclists, bicyclists along the residential entrance drive. With that being said, Mayor, I'll turn the floor back over to you. Thank you. Okay, you sure you got everything in? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Bradley. <laughs> Very I thorough can, report. I can start over. Maybe I missed something. 
No, I don't think you did, but thank you. Okay, at this time, I'd like to give the applicant an opportunity to make a presentation. Sure, thank you, Mayor. Um, I think I just need to be sworn in first. This is, can you hear me? We can yes, hear you, yes. Do you need yes. to put up a present, uh, uh, presentation? Yes. I, I do as well, yes. Official, That's why I think well, yes. You don't have to be sworn in. You don't need to be sworn in. But, but if you think we need to swear you in, we will. Uh, this is oh, we lost you. This you? Well, we have you, but we we have something here on the screen. We gave him the we gave Doug the to be presenter. If you're the presenter, you are okay. Okay, can you see the uh, presentation? Yes, yes, we can. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. My name is Doug Murray with WGI, and uh, I have before you tonight the Lakeside Landing Comprehensive Plan Amendment. So again, I know Bradford covered a lot of this, but uh, uh, let me re repeat uh, Bradford on a few of these things and uh, add some additional information for you guys. So again, it's a large-scale comprehensive plan amendment from the commercial future land use to multifamily low-density residential. And here's a overall location map of the site. I know you guys are pretty familiar with it, but uh, Okeechobee Road, Palm Beach Boulevard, behind Village Royale Shopping Plaza, separated by the Madison Green community to the west by the M1 Canal. And there's a body of water coming off the canal uh, to the north and uh, the multifamily Versa apartment uh, to the north as well. Overall acres is 12.28 acres. Um, existing Future land use is commercial, proposed is, again, multifamily low. The existing zoning is general commercial, and the proposed zoning, uh, which will be a future request, would be RM9. And again, the request is for 100 fee simple townhomes. So this site is actually part of a overall commercial development. Uh, it still has a valid approval, even on the undeveloped portion, which is uh, the entirety of the subject property is, is the undeveloped portion of the, of the uh, commercial. And uh, since the original approval, it was in 1988. Uh, the overall square footage of the waterway plaza development is 147,000 square feet. And since then, there's been uh, various modifications for just a variety of change in uh, commercial uses. So this, this is an overlay of the approved site plan for waterway plaza uh, in, in white here over the aerial. So again, the overall square footage um, is 147,000 square feet. And then this graphic shows in red that the that the unconstructed portion is a little over 106,000 square feet. And you can see, um, as you know, down at uh, Okeechobee Boulevard, you have the Chevron. And then over on Royal Palm Beach Boulevard, you have the existing shared access drive with Exxon, Meineke, Car Wash to the south, Dunkin' Donuts to the north, and the vacant parcel that was recently received a, a approval for a new Dunkin' Donuts. Um, and then on the unconstructed portion, it, it's a mixture of retail, office, and uh, motel use. So with the with the current approval in place, the unbuilt waterway plaza square footage, which again was 106,000 square feet, we did a traffic comparison. So as it, you know, if, if that was actually built today, the total trip would be 3,237. And compared to the site being constructed as 100 townhomes, we have which would be 732 trips. So you can see it would be a really a substantial reduction uh, with the conversion here to residential. So it's a, actually a 77 percent 77 percent decrease in trips that you'd be looking at. Uh, I know Brad would show this, but we have the traffic approval from Palm Beach County meets CPS standards of the county. Here we have the proposed site plan, uh, just a rendering of the proposed site plan, but again, in front of you is just the just the land use, but um, we can talk about some of the some of the compatibility issues that Bradford brought up, uh, which is 
you know, to the subject of the uh, recommending denial. So starting on the west side of the property, we have the M1 canal, which is a 200 foot canal, but if you include the easements, maintenance easements on both sides, you, you have about 240 feet separating this development from Madison Green. So that's a nice buffer on the, on the west side there. And then we get into, um, again, one of the reasons staff is recommending denial is, is for the buffers, uh, the fact that even though it's a 25 foot buffer required, we essentially have to make up for the fact that the existing plaza did not have a buffer. So we would ultimately have to propose that a 50 foot total buffer. So what we're proposing uh, when we submit the site plan would be to propose a 25 foot buffer with a six foot wall. Six foot wall, we feel should help mitigate the extra 25 foot width um, along with uh, you know lush landscaping. Another point that I want to bring up that that adds to the fact that we have uh, the 25 foot buffer with a wall with a wall is that if you look at a majority of the of the townhomes that we were proposing, we would be proposing the the interior street to be against the property line or against the buffer rather. So we actually have a hundred foot separation. We actually have a hundred foot separation between the the townhome and the property line. Um, so with that said, if you, you know, if we were to provide the 50 foot buffer and back up to the, back up to the buffer, we would actually not even, we would have a less, lesser of a separation between the townhomes and the property line. Um, sorry about that. Sorry, can you can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you're fine. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, sorry, something came up. Sorry about that. Um, okay, continuing on here. Um, so going up to the access off of Royal Palm Beach Boulevard, we have the gated entrance that we're proposing. Off again, that existing shared access, there, there is a sidewalk connection. We will have access to that sidewalk, which is on the north side of the 50 foot access road. Uh, we do have a shared access agreement with that property owner, with, with both property owners. So we'll be able to utilize that sidewalk for connection over to Palm Beach, uh, Royal Palm Beach Boulevard for these future residents. In addition, um, I, I know uh, Bradford mentioned the support from the, from the adjacent Plaza owner here, and in, and speaking with him, um, we're also going to be proposing on the site plan that we have a, a cross access, a pedestrian cross access. So we're going to have a break in the wall with a gate for pedestrians only, and they're going to have access from uh, via a path through to the to the plaza. There's a green space. If you look, it's a little hard to see here, but there is a green space there, and we will provide a path that goes through. There's a separation between those buildings there, and that way. Uh, if, if the future residents want to enjoy shopping, dining, uh, things of that nature, they can cut right through without having to walk completely around the wall and uh, through other parts of the development. Again, there's a letter of support Bradford mentioned, um, you know, in short, basically saying that they, they support the additional residential. They feel that there's already too much commercial in the area. Um, and, that, and that any additional commercial would be unnecessary. So in addition to the buffering adjacent to the commercial, we have this, we have this existing access road here, this 50 foot access road that will change in land use from commercial to residential. So with that being existing, um, that would end where we have the gated entrance to the townhouses. Um, again, we have in the existing sidewalk, as you can see on the north side here, so that will extend over this roadway and into the into the future townhome. So we, we will have pedestrian access through um, to give those, them access to Royal Palm Beach Boulevard. Um, so obviously we do not have room on both sides here to, to have a buffer. Um, this is a shared access. Um, there's no residential units in this area. The, the, the land use and the zoning might be might be residential, but with it essentially just being a roadway, we don't have residential units. We feel there's no reason to even have any buffer in this area because it is a shared a shared access road that exists today. Um, so again, no need to buffer from an existing roadway. And uh, as was mentioned, if, if 
if there was any buffering that would be provided, you'd be impacting all this existing parking for these business owners here. And they, you know, essentially there would be no need to have a 50 foot buffer because you'd be screening their businesses. Um, you'd affect the business if, if you had a 50 foot wide buffer there. Um, so essentially we're proposing to leave this as is. We'd be requesting those waivers uh, from the code and leaving this as is with the exception of working with these property owners to, to, to try to provide enhanced landscape on both sides of the road, working with those property owners um, to, again, enhance that landscape to provide a nice entrance to for both the residential and the commercial. And lastly, the the other item that was uh, a reason for recommendation, recommending denial is this existing sign, which is outside the property. So this sign was actually constructed by the property owner, Mr. Santa Maria. He has an he has an easement over the sign. The sign's not on his property, but it is part of a sign easement, which is which is shown here. So he constructed the sign. He has an easement for the sign. He has a, he essentially can tear down the sign if he wants to. So if this sign, um, you know, it is going to be viewed as an off-site sign which currently it only has signage for the parcel that it's on, which is Dunkin' Donuts, um, has no other signage for any other parcels. But if this is viewed as an off-site sign and not meeting code, it can be removed by the property owner and he'd be happy to do so. Uh, just some quick examples of some other developments in the village. Um, so this is, this is a park air apartment complex. You can see the, the MFL land use here and then at the top it's circled in yellow they have an access that's very similar to what we're proposing here so uh, let me zoom in a little bit here so you can see that off of state road 7 christina drive as you continue into the residential apartment complex you're you're essentially doing the same thing you're cutting through two commercial sites and there's no buffering provided if there is a buffer provided that you can see it's it's, it's minimal so essentially that's an, a development that the village has approved and we're proposing a very similar concept. <clears throat> Here's another one. It's a, a little bit different example. It's not of an, not of an entrance, but the Cypress Key development, um, which is under construction and they're about to build the commercial out front. But we understand that this was approved under a mixed use zoning. However, it still shows that you, you have residential, you have townhomes, that are gonna coexist with a shopping plaza, with, with retail, with commercial, you have, you're gonna have these townhomes which are fronting onto this 50 foot right away. And, you know, I apologize, this plan's a little hard to read here, but there's essentially no buffer between those townhomes and the rear of these, of these retail establishments here. You have a drive-through for a restaurant here with, you know, within, within about 10 feet of the sidewalk. Um, and you have loading areas that are uh, behind these restaurants that these that these single that these uh, townhouses are looking at. And then at the closest point here, you have about 80 feet between the back of the the back of the retail to the front of these townhomes here. Uh, so we do meet all of the standards, the future land use amendment standards of the code. And in conclusion. With this residential development, with the conversion to residential, there will be a substantial reduction in the amount of traffic generated, which was a 77% reduction. The compatibility concerns between townhomes and commercial uses will be addressed with the appropriate buffering. We're proposing, again, a 25-foot buffer, lushly landscaped. Um, you know, I'm sure it will be above code, and we have the six-foot wall to help mitigate any sound, uh, visual, um, issues there. Um, and, and lastly, this location is just not fit for commercial. It's hidden, essentially hidden behind the, the Village Royale Shopping Center. It has no visibility. Um, you know, it, it, in my opinion, it's the perfect site for residential because it's backing up onto the water um, and it allows the future residents to have access to that, to that plaza, which according to the owner um, could definitely use some additional business. Um, outside, outside of COVID-19, um, 
that they could still use um, a lot more business. And um, you know, as far as the, the the other uses surrounding it, we feel it's an ideal transition. It's it's next to it's next to Madison Green, which is um, Im immediately to the west, and there's zero law line community, um, single family development. So you're, it's an ideal transition from that single family development. Then we have a wide 240 foot canal. Then we're proposing fee simple townhomes. And then you have the commercial. And then to the north, you have the apartments. So we feel it's an ideal location here to, to, to have these 100 townhomes. That concludes my presentation. Um, there's just some snippets on the screen here of um, a similar product to what DR Horton is proposing. I, I didn't mention that DR Horton was chosen as the as the builder here for the townhomes by Mr. Santa Maria. Um, so with that, I would like to open it up for any any questions um, that you or the public have on this project. Okay, okay thank you, Doug. Before we <clears throat> start taking comments from council, I want to give the public a chance to make comments. We do have comment cards here. Uh, before I take uh, comments from the public, though, I want to remind everyone we did put a notice out uh, for the electronic meeting members of the public, and they were encouraged to provide public comment to the village clerk prior to this meeting via email or phone. And I'd like to confirm now with the village clerk whether or not we have any comments that were sent in advance. Uh, yes, Mayor, I have two comments that I can read into the record. Please read them into the record. Um, the first one from Craig Falkowski. 1547 Fiddlewood Court, Royal Palm Beach. Please add my comment to the record regarding the zoning proposal from Mr. Santa Maria to change the use from commercial to re residential. As a 16-year resident of Royal Palm Beach, I am against this proposal. The entire area from the canal on the north side of the property to Okeechobee Boulevard is all commercial, <coughs> consisting of shopping centers, fast food, and gas stations. Adding a residential component in the middle of this heavily commercial area would not be advisable for the village or the future residents of this development proposed. Getting into and out of this area is already very difficult. Adding over 100 cars plus countless trips in and out would cause traffic problems and possible increase in car accidents. It would be next to impossible to add another traffic control device since one is less than 100 feet away from ac for access to Publix and Winn-Dixie. I'm asking the council to deny this application as a pro as a proposed. Thank you. And I received one other, and it's from William Wiener, owner of the Village Royale Shopping Center, 1177A Royal Palm Beach Boulevard, Royal Palm Beach. The 12.85 acres directly north adjacent to my Village Royale Winn-Dixie Shopping Center <coughs> Currently zoned general commercial is a very irregularly shaped land with very poor visibility from its main road, Royal Palm Beach Boulevard, and therefore not good for any retail businesses. In addition, there is no need for any more commercial in that area that already has both the Winn-Dixie and public shopping centers across from each other, which is more than enough for that area. On the other hand, those 12.85 acres would be ideal for a low density residential development of 100 townhomes overlooking the beautiful large lake across from rental apartments in the north and some two story zero lot line homes across the 200 foot M1 canal. I am sure that these residents would rather see beautifully landscaped townhomes rather than look at the rear of retail stores and restaurants. My shopping center most certainly would appreciate the 100 families approximately 300 <coughs> residents who could walk to our stores, restaurants, and supermarket without having to cross the street. That would most certainly reduce traffic and provide a great convenience to at least 300 village residents. All the businesses in my shopping center and all the businesses across the street in the public shopping center will appreciate your approval of the 100 townhomes instead of the unnecessary additional retail shops. Thank you. And that's all I received. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have some comment cards from some of the people who are here this evening. Let's start with Mr. Robert Boyd. I don't have anything in writing. My concern mainly was... Can you... 
access onto uh, commercial, Bo I mean, uh, Okeechobee directly from there, and I can see from their map that they are not going to do that. Uh, is that firm? They will never put a road through and try and get out directly on uh, that road? Because if they do, their only way out is to go west to commercial and then south to southern, which everything's going to southern boulevard. Right now we have half of the west end of the county that's growing into 40,000 homes or whatever, trying to go down that same road. At, uh, I don't know, 8.30 to 10 o'clock in the morning, you can't make turns onto that road, make a left-hand turn onto it. You can sit there for 20 minutes and not get across. Wh which road are you talking about? Commer uh, Cypress. Southbound traffic coming out of the developments and the, the big trucks and equipment trucks and trailers with big equipment on them, and then mom's trying to get in and out of school. Uh, that's a mess over there, man. And I don't see that getting better for a couple of years. I'm hoping that traffic isn't going to add to it. And the first guy that spoke on that development said there would be, um, I forget the term he used, limited capacitance in each apartment. Does anybody know what that limit is? I don't know what he was talking about limited capacity. He was talk what he was talking about is cap compatibility between the between the townhomes and the commercial. He didn't talk about capacity of the residential. I, I think we should have a capacitance per unit on that. We and it doesn't turn into a little Havana with forty eight thousand people per apartment. <laughs> well that, we can't address that at Land Use. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, sir. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your service on this committee. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I hope I got this right. You all is? He, he, generic. Like guys. Generic. <laughs> <laughs> is it you all is? You all is? Please, come up, come down to the <laughs> Go, over Go there. back <laughs> to the podium. <laughs> Urellis, Vega, and my address is 120 Queens Lane, Royal Palm Beach. So, um, I've lived in Royal Palm Beach since 2006. Um, I raised my two kids here. They're now 14 and 16. And I basically moved here to get away from the hustle and bustle. I used to live in Miami, grew up in Miami lived in Broward County, and I just wanted a slower pace. Um, I've seen a lot of changes take place in the past 14 years. New shopping centers, new construction, new housing, and even a new sheriff in town, literally. Um, and with these changes, there's been an increase in traffic, an increase in population, and even an increase in crime, obviously, we need more people. Um, and I used to go to stores and I used to find parking right away. Um, now I circle around. I used to be able to get to the turnpike in about 12 minutes or 15 or so. Now it could take 20 to 25 minutes depending on the time of the day. And the question at hand is whether a change in zoning should be approved from commercial to residential for this land. And um, I'm obviously I'm opposed to this zoning change. Um, there's currently 344 houses for sale on the market, according to Real, um, Realtor.com in Royal Palm Beach. And in these years that I've been living here, there's been new construction. There's been um, 300 and, oh, out, 392 apartments built at Town Southern. Belicero was approved for and built at the old water site. Cypress Key townhomes were built on Southern. And the uh, neighboring city of, of Loxahatchee has built Westlake and Arden. And there's even possible plans of the village golf being transformed from a golf, a golf course to um, a residential. So um, I guess is it, is it time, to, I, I guess the go I want to know is the goal, what the goal of the village is. Is the goal to continue to expand the city beyond capacity? Or is it to maintain the quality of life for the residents and the tax, the tax paying residents? And recently I read an article, I had uh, a few months ago, I had read where the village had stated that Royal Palm Beach was uh, pretty much built out. And 
but yet it seems that we keep finding ways to continue to build. And I think that if we continue to build, you, you can definitely fill those homes. I mean, if we build 50,000 homes, we could fill the 50,000 homes. People would come from other areas and so forth. But um, is, so my question is, is there actually a housing shortage in the village? Oh, that's it. Finish your statement. Yeah. Oh. Seconds. OK, I was just saying, is there actually a, a housing shortage in the village? So is this something that we need, or is this something that someone just wants? Um, and that's, I guess, what, what I would like to, to get addressed. I feel the area is overcrowded. And um, I just want, just as a closing statement, I wanted to say, um, you know, folks, we're at capacity right now, and I think it's time to recognize this and that we begin working towards maintaining our quality of life to, a, to the highest standards. And so I urge the council to deny this motion for rezoning, as it does negatively impact the community by impacting traffic, wildlife, and causing an increase to population to our area. Okay. Thank you for your comments, ma'am. Okay. Vern Heatherick, too. My name is Vern Hetherington. I live at 1122 Oak Water Drive, which is in Wyndham, Madison Green. The rear of my home actually is on the M1 Canal and faces the subject property. Uh, this property for 19 years has been the buffer between the shopping center and the homes in Madison Green. Uh, to build these townhomes now, they're going to have to remove all the trees. Even the proposed landscaping they want to do is not going to replace those trees. And currently, these, this wooded area is the home to many uh, different animals. I took some pictures. I had an opportunity at 4 o'clock today for a photo op. And that was uh, a woodstock and a, a Rosetta rosebill, two of them side by side, which is extremely rare. The rosebill, uh, the spoonbill, actually resides in the wooded area. And feeds off the M1 canal. Uh, the wooded area is also uh, occupied by wood stork, blue herring, green herring, osprey, which live there, the burrowing owls, which also live there, and the hawks that visit. If you tear these trees down, where are they going to go? This is one of the last or the few remaining wooded areas in Royal Palm Beach. And if we take that down, where do the animals go? I have no idea. And I don't think it. Uh, this is something that we need to do to add a hundred more townhomes to Royal Palm Beach with all the construction that we've got going on right now uh, with new homes. Uh, that's pretty much what I'm going to say. Okay, thank you, sir, for your comment. Okay, um, is it Bernie Homestock? Hello, Bernie Homestock. I live at 2013 Reston Circle in Madison Green. Uh, I've been a resident for 18 years. I serve on the village board for Fairfax Village, and also I'm on the Master uh, Association Board. Um, I've spoken to a few residents, not as many as I'd like to. I think the general consensus from what I've heard so far is that we would like to leave the property commercial. It's my understanding that as a village we have more, much more control over what we'll see um, along the M1 Canal as a commercial property rather than residential, multifamily at that. Um, my concern is mostly for the Wyndham Village residents and the Fairfax Village uh, directly across the canal, 200 yards or feet, uh, is not that much of a distance. Uh, I feel we'd much rather see something like the facade, the back of Costco, which is beautiful, than multifamily homes along the canal. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Okay. In general comments. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments, sir. Steve Fidenak? Fidenak? How close did I get to your name? You're good. My name Fair is Steve thing. Firetag. Firetag. Oh, uh, ah, okay. <laughs> you know, I was going to say you fire at first, there. but that E was there. I was Hold doing a German piece. A Don't feel bad because I have trouble saying it too. Okay. <laughs> My name is Steve Firetag. I live at 2107 Restaurant Circle this coming August. I'm uh, very glad to have been a resident of Royal Palm Beach for 19 years. 
The applicant is a good man, a very good man. I don't have to tell you the lengthy list of all of the good things he's done, not only for Royal Palm Beach, but Palm Beach County. I voted for him every time he's run for office, and if he was running again this November, I would vote for him again. However, I implore you to not only continue being honest to the residents of Royal Palm Beach, but more importantly to yourselves, and not allow personalities to enter into your decision on this matter at all. In some ways, it's a small decision, a small matter, but to many of us, it's important. Please leave the personalities out. I have not had an opportunity to look at the traffic impact study, but to be honest with you, I'm baffled. How a commercial property in an area could have four times more traffic than 100 townhomes baffles me. I haven't looked at the assumptions. I haven't had that opportunity. I strongly encourage you to. However, the applicant on the record a few moments ago in his own words said that based on the location and shape of that property, it is not fit for commercial use because of its hidden location and the limited road access, and there's also enough commercial in the immediate area. So with all that said, what kind of commercial activity would have four times the road traffic? Beats me. I'm baffled. If you look at our local roads, not the state roads, but the local roads and intersections, where would be the worst place to put a development like this? Our busiest intersection locally is Royal Palm Beach Boulevard and Okeechobee Boulevard, and that's where this will impact. We look at Objective LU 1.10, which I learned tonight by looking at the screen. The village is to make sure with any development or redevelopment, there's no negative impact on the community and surrounding area. Having additional students now at schools, while their impact study may say we could handle it, that's not a positive impact, it's a negative impact. On the roads, again, personally, I'm not an expert, but I doubt the validity of that traffic study. I believe we have a negative impact on our roads. When we look at that compared to whatever someday may be built commercially. Can I have one more minute? You have one final comment? Go ahead. Okay, thank you. As Bernie Mullen, uh, uh, I'm sorry, as Bernie Holmstock said, uh, we also, from my understanding, have a lot more control. We as the residents, you as the village council and the village planning and zoning board, I understand, have a lot more say in what the landscaping will be if it remains commercial than if it's turned over and converted to residential property. Just because you approved mixed use with Cypress Key does not force you to have mixed use here. Thank you. All right, thank you for your comments, sir. I just want to make one note on a point you raised. Go ahead, have your seat questioning the validity of the traffic study. The traffic study is not done independently by the, the people who want to do the project. That has to be performed and, and certified by the county under something called traffic performance standards. So I don't want you to think this is something that the people who want to do the development have cooked up and said, here are the numbers. Those numbers are certified by the county under TP, and we're not, we have never called over that ourselves. No, no, I, I, just, I, I just wanted to let you know the validity of the, because we do depend on, on that. Though, you know, one of the first questions I asked when I heard about this project was, did they get a certificate, which meant they got clearance from the, from the uh, county on the traffic performance standards? But I just wanted to, because you, you seem to question the validity of that, I just wanted to mention that. Okay, well, all right. Um, I have no other comment cards uh, for agenda item R2. You would like to comment? Come on up. I'll go on back, rather. <laughs> My name is David Swift. I live at 240 Ponce de Leon in Royal Palm Beach. Um, I am familiar with this piece of property. Um, had a good friend of mine back in the 80s who had was working with Mr. San Maria uh, to try to develop it. And he, he was starting to 
he, he went to look at restaurants and bringing uh, uh, that kind of traffic to develop that site. And he had a very, very difficult, well, he was not successful. And uh, uh, he tried very hard to do that. And there are many things that wouldn't do that. Some people wanted to, uh, to see, I've, I've heard on uh, some people comment on this piece of property, they wanted to see maybe a dock and boats and things like that. And it, you know, it's, it's a drainage canal. Uh, <laughs> I don't think you want to have that kind of traffic on a drainage canal or to be like one of bananas in, in uh, uh, Jupiter. Um, anyways, make a long story short, uh, what I've seen tonight, I like. I think that is uh, a, a good step forward. I think the, the commercial development would really be an eyesore. If I would want to direct the council to, to look at is look at, to work with the people over Madison Green or, or, or adjacent there and look at landscaping on the, on the piece of that commercial property so that it's not going to be an ugly eyesore uh, for somebody who doesn't keep their backyard. I, I don't know if you could actually have, I'd actually talk with some of the landowners there before when I was on council and we, uh, the, the village manager and I talked about a pathway and, and could the federal government come in and possibly fund it, make it some sort of public access and come up with some real landscaping on that place to make it kind of a promenade that, that residents in could use, but obviously it's a, a private thing in the backyard there. So, anyways, but I, I would really recommend you work with uh, the residents back uh, uh, across the canal. Um, I, I think this is a, a could be a major step forward instead of a step to have commercial develop it, to have a, 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 a residential developer where you can work with the residents to, to develop a, an appropriate landscape plan. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Ma'am, go, go on down, come on down. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Angelique Palmer. I live at 1307 Islesworth Port. Um, I've lived in Madison Green, Wyndham Village for 19 years. I am also the president of Wyndham for the past six years. All of the residents from Wyndham that I have spoken to, as well as the rest of the residents in Madison Green that I have spoken to, are all opposed to this development change from commercial to residential, from all for all the reasons cited, um, they are concerned about traffic, and I agree with Steve. I believe that a hundred homes with several people inside that drive, with more people that have cars, is going to have a great impact um, on our roads, on our on our primary roads in Royal Palm. I believe that the schools are going to be affected. And the study that I saw over there was from 2015. We now have Bella Sara. We now have a whole bunch of homes that are being built all around that will utilize our, our school system. We are also um, concerned about the backs of the townhomes, how people will keep their townhomes. These are townhomes. They're not single family homes. We don't know how that's going to look either. So we are concerned about that and we would rather have it commercial. So I just wanted to add um, my vote because we are one of the villages. We have 192 homes in Wyndham. And we are against it. So I wanted to um, put in our two cents. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Going once, going twice. Anyone else here would like a comment? Seeing none, uh, we're closing public comment then to agenda item R2. And I'll open up for comments from members on council. Who's first? Yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll go. I'll All start. Right. So one, one of the things that uh, I decided to do uh, when I heard about this was uh, go over and actually look at the property, uh, basically walk the property. Uh, and uh, that we're talking about this 12 plus acres. And um, I guess across the canal, it doesn't look too bad when you get close up. Looks a good bit like a, like a dump site uh, with a lot of trees. Um, that's not the kind of quality property that I think will help us maintain the character of our community and quality of our life, quite frankly. Uh, it's, it's been out like that for a long time. It's, it's hard to do much with it. Um, I invite you all to go over and take a look at it. Uh, it, is, it is a combination of um, the um, results of 
backing onto a uh, commercial area, uh, which uh, has its loading docks uh, right adjacent to it. How convenient uh, to dump whatever trash doesn't fit into uh, the dumpsy dumpster and, and um, might be convenient for other reasons. The other thing is that that area right now is, is um, uh, actually a place where uh, it's well policed. That's the good news. Uh, the bad news is it needs to be. Uh, there have been several, many arrests uh, for drug dealing and things of that nature. Um, while we need to take care of the homeless, that isn't providing them with a, a good solution. Um, it's, it's not the area. And if you, if you doubt or question that um, it's used for that purpose, again, I suggest go visit the property itself. That property really is not what it needs to be in the center of Royal Palm Beach. It really, really isn't. And um, while I'm concerned about the number of compatibility issues that uh, the staff has identified with that property and the ability to actually reasonably address those issues, um, the idea of leaving the property as it is right now um, is, is a concern. And so far as the traffic is concerned, I hear it over and over again. And, you know, one home is one one too many because there's one more couple of pair of cars and that kind of thing. I, I get I get that mindset. I understand that. Um, but but the reality is that this the study itself, again, as the mayor just said, gets reviewed by by the uh, by the county and doesn't get approved unless. They look at the assumptions, they look at the entire study, they evaluate it, and um, determine that indeed it's, it's valid, uh, and it will allow uh, the roads to continue to handle at, um, at the level of, um, of performance uh, that's required for that particular road. Now, when you're trying to get out of your driveway or out onto Royal Palm Beach Boulevard or something of that nature, um, having that study in your hand is not going to help you. It, it is adding traffic, um, but it's adding less traffic than commercial would, according to the study, and I trust the study simply because it is reviewed and we have to rely upon those kind of assessments unless somebody finds a flaw in that, in that particular study. The other thing is uh, that the, um, the development uh, itself, again, uh, has a bunch of compatibility challenges, and, and so um, – that's, that's an important consideration going forward. We're, we're taking a step in that direction and if we ap approve this change, uh, even though we're not at that level of detail. So this is challenging, at least from my point of view, to try to figure out what's the right thing to do for uh, the, the best interest of, of Royal Palm Beach. One other thing as a kind of a parting comment uh, or a finishing comment on this thing is we are so proud of the fact that we are a very attractive community for young families. And in this day and age, it's, it's hard to find um, properties that can be afforded uh, by young families. Um, starter homes oftentimes um, are townhouses. Um, my son did that when he um, moved and and it, and it worked well for him for that period of time, but then there was a time to change and move. One of the things we have here in Royal Palm Beach is, is a good inventory of homes, a good selection, a good assortment. Uh, and and um, the, the townhouses are really important, I think, to attracting young families and continuing on as a vibrant community. So um, I, I do indeed have um, strong concerns for uh, going forward with this townhouse development, but at the same time, um, I, I think it would be in the best interest of the, of the village as opposed to uh, leaving it as a commercial development activity. I'm happy, I'm happy to go next. When I think about this and what's in front of us, I think about the long view. The property was zoned commercial in 1980. 88, 88, sorry, 88. And Mr. Santa Maria bought it in 1990, a few years later, thinking it would be a really good commercial property. And I think it is. I think he was ahead of his time 
we're now in a position to really help not only Royal Palm, but also our Western community friends and our, and our, our residents. So across the street is our cultural center that we just renovated. And we have um, the opportunity to have weddings and larger ceremonies and smaller conferences. And what was originally put on that um, planning site was a hotel. And wouldn't that be wonderful for the two to, no pun intended, marry each other, right? So now you have the opportunity to bring in um, smaller weddings. Um, you've got a hotel right there. They can cross the street. We're not talking about a lot of cars. They can Uber to the hotel or whatever. Additionally, there is no hotel between um, Okeechobee and West and, and our neighbors to Westlake and Arden. Um, and I really think that we have an opportunity to, maybe not today, develop that land as a hotel, but I think we it, it's, it's sort of a gold mine if you look at it, and the ability to be, be creative and think bigger than just making a decision right now because this is what's on the table. So um, I'm really thinking about how do we use that piece of property in the best way for our residents going forward. And while we do have a motel in town, it is not a hotel and it's not close. So there's differences between what we have and what we could have. And so um, I'm just going to let you know that I'm not going to be in favor of this decision tonight. Thank you. Um, well, I, I can tell you I'm, I'm not a big fan of uh, having commercial uh, exactly next door to residential. Uh, I moved to the village and uh, I moved into a residential neighborhood, and I had a residential neighborhood next door to me, and the uh, village changed it to a commercial neighborhood. And some people brought it about tonight, and, and I live every day. I, I know the problems with that. Um, Mr. Steve, I, I, um, Jan noted, the re I, I, to me, the reason for the disparity in the traffic, and I am all for reducing the traffic, the townhomes, in my opinion, would create less traffic because you don't have a hotel. And you don't have all these things that are already approved. That, that's they've got vested rights to build those things now. And just from walking around where my neighborhood is, even with you know the commercial not done on Cypress Key, but there's a lot of townhomes, and I got maybe 70 to 90 houses in my neighborhood. I can tell you there's a lot more traffic around the Royal Inn and the businesses in there than there are coming through my neighborhood. So that's one thing that helps me. Uh, is reduced traffic. Okay, that's a, a point for the townhouses. Um, but uh, I, I guess I, I somewhat agree with Councilman Swift is, hey, this looks like something that could be a benefit. But I also <laughs> look at the fact that, you know, this, I mean, we're at the land use now. Land use, you're not supposed to look at what's going to be built and what's going to end up because I see a lot of issues um, I see the number 100. That seems like a lot to me. Um, I think there's going to be issues with complying with our codes on the buffers. We already know that. Can that be mitigated? Um, parking, that seems to me to be an issue. Amenities, again, these are all certain things, but they're not things I'm supposed to take into account now because we're not at the site plan to issue. Um, I guess I'm... I'm on the edge, but leaning towards actually changing it to housing. But it's going to be, in my opinion, a tough road to hoe to make that accommodating to um, to, to buffer and, and do right by the community. So, yeah, I'm, I may vote to switch the land use resignation, the designation, but that doesn't mean I'm ultimately going to vote on what, whatever comes before us on site plan. Okay. Please. It, it is. It's a difficult decision just because of every all the moving parts that go with it. Um, first of all, it, because it is zoned commercial right now, is the intent to develop it commercial if it is not if the land use is not changed to residential? Do you have any? We have no other development interest in it at this time. I and mean, the if, it was, if it was left land use commercial, then it would. It would. We have not talked to anybody about or the or the property owner about developing it as commercial. That's what so the property owner didn't say is if you don't convert it, I am going to then develop it into. He's he, ha he has not shared with us okay. 
his plans other than trying to sell it to a residential. Yes. Okay. And my concern is the traffic as well. I lived in Miami. I joke around. It took me 20 minutes to get to the grocery store, and it was less than a mile away. So I completely sympathize with that. Um, just considering the current climate that we live in as far as commercial versus residential, um, I do see that the demand for commercial is decreasing. Um, there are across the street more buildings that are being built in that medical area across the street just north of McDonald's. And I see the vacant buildings that are inside that shopping plaza. I eat in the restaurants I shop in, the Winn-Dixie Plaza in there. Um, I'm tending to think that residential would be better than commercial just because of the um, less amount of impact, but the, the more family environment. The I've never considered what Councilwoman uh, Radusky said about the hotel. Uh, that is an interesting concept, I didn't, and it makes sense considering the cultural centers right there. I tend to, um, I am agreeing in a lot of what Councilman Valentis is saying as far as my concerns moving forward. Um, I don't, if I had to choice between the two, I'm, I'm thinking that residential might be better for that property than commercial, but my concerns are going forward that there's a, a lot of variances that they're going to have to ask for, and it is a trickle down of all of that. My other concern was is the Dunkin' Donuts property there. We just approved that new site. Once the, if we do make this commer uh, residential, because the, um, the entryway is not going to be what needs to be per our code, then that onus is going to fall on that business owner to then face that issue too. So those are, it's the trickle down of all these other variances that are going to be needed that are going through that um, I have a hard time seeing how a residential area is going to work on that property too. Okay. Sure, go ahead. I just wanted to tell you that you do have some attendees out there. Uh, they have not raised their hand to speak, but I think if you give them that opportunity, ask them if any of them want to talk. I have I, like I said, I have, I do have five people out there as attendees listening to this, uh, and ha do have the right to speak. Uh, I already called public comment. Okay, I know. Right. I just wanted to make sure you knew they were out there, no. and that. And but that because they, of the they, circumstances, and I was, I'm trying to tell them too to raise their no, hand no. if they want to speak. All right, because they're not yet. <laughs> because of the circumstances that we're operating under, if anyone raises their hand, they have not. let them do it now so we can hear their comments. Going once, going twice. This can't be that much of a delay. How much of a delay? <laughs> I mean, if, if you want, I, I could turn their, I can turn their voice on, and, and but they're not asking to speak. So, well, that's the procedure. They have to. They have to raise their hand. Raise your hand. Was, click the raise your hand button. Does that literally raise your hand? There's a button you click that says raise your hand. Correct. Raise your hand. <laughs> I've been doing so many of these. Zoom meetings, it's like, I'm getting used to it now. <laughs> we have none still? Okay, we'll move on then. Um, I really appreciate all the different cont uh, thoughts and, 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 and questions and, and concerns that have been raised. Um, I just want to kind of briefly uh, try to put some context around some of the perspectives. First of all, I want to make something clear. This is not a, a village of Royal Palm Beach project. We don't own this property. It's not our property. It's not our project. This is a private landowner, just like all of you are landowners of your property, your homes. And uh, this is obviously uh, a, a large property that the landowner would like to develop and realize the value of the property that he purchased, I guess, some in, back in 1990. So I just want to make that clear this is not we're not in a situation tonight where the council is deciding what we want to put there we're being asked by the landowner to change the zoning that was put in place on this property in 1988 when that was done there was an associated plan and in that plan there was a notion of maybe we'll build another hotel it just so happened the landowner owns the other hotel in the village 
So clearly the thinking then was, wow, this is back in 1990. Maybe we might need to put a, build, you know, build another hotel and let's do a, a, a plan that would, would show something like that. Um, those of you who've lived in a village for more than 15 years, I think you would agree. We've had extraordinary growth and development in the village, in particular commercial growth and development. And any of you been to Carabas lately is open again, but that whole shopping center where Costco is, that didn't exist. I can remember personally, I, I like Carabas. I used to drive all the way down to Palm Beach Lakes to go to Carabas, all right? So the point I'm making is we've had a tremendous amount of growth, uh, commercial growth, uh, throughout the village since 1988. And <laughs> I get comments frequently from our residents. They ask the question about all these empty stalls we see around the village in the shopping commercial areas we have. And they say, well, what, do you, you know, what, what can we what are we do about these empty stalls? And my answer to them is, that's the open market. That's private sector, right? Just private business. And that's their issue to deal with and we wouldn't spend taxpayer dollars to fix their business problem. All right? I've given that answer hundreds of times because that's how we do business here in the village. But the point is, <laughs> adding more commercials is only going to exacerbate the problem of, these, of empty stores and exacerbate the problem of businesses being able to be successful within our village. So it's very clear to me that we don't need more commercial building in the village of Walpaw Beach. So that's point number one. Point number two, actually. Point number three is something that was already mentioned by members on the council, which is real. And, and uh, I want to say, Doug, I appreciate your presentation. I think you, you really uh, went uh, pretty far downstream than would normally be presented at a land use change. But I get it. You know, you had to address, and I, I'm glad you addressed many of the concerns that were raised by staff. And staff had to make their decision based on a technical assessment. Staff is looking at the situation. You have a pre-existing structure there in terms of the commercial property. For reasons I don't know, and I'm not going to ask, they weren't required to put in this 25-foot buffer, which was their half of the buffer requirement of 50 feet. It was supposed to be they did half, and they, whoever built on the other side would do half. Didn't happen that way, so now they want to build on the other side. Staff is saying, well, yeah, there's got to be this 50-foot buffer thing. Um, I'm glad to see that there was something presented in the presentation that uh, looking at the, the site plan that you guys are putting together to address that, all right? And this council will have to, you know, look at that point when we're presented, with, if we pass this, if we present it with site plans, how well it's addressed. Um, I think there's other suggestions that will come from this council if this moves forward on how the land use, the, the uh, site plan can be done in a way that addresses as many of these concerns that were raised by staff as possible. Now, there's two variables here that, that drive this. One is, yes, we are very interested in maintaining the quality of life we have in the village, and we do put forth our guidance and input via the statutes we have in place and by the talent of our staff and members on council to, to assess and say, yeah, this is something that looks really good if you did that, and this is something that you're thinking about doing that maybe not such a good idea, and we will do that. But, but the, the other driving point is, I always ask this question. I ask this question, if you've heard me over the years, when um, uh, if, it's, if uh, someone wants to come in and open up a new store here in a village, right, or a new restaurant, or in this case, develop uh, places for people to live, homes, townhomes, high-end uh, apartments. Uh, we've got a high-end apartment. I remember when that project came in, we were all very skeptical of that. And one of the, re one of the things I asked the developer, I said, what makes you think, or why, you know, what market research have you done to convince you that these type of high-end apartments would, would, would do well in the marketplace, that people would want to live there? And they responded, they, they did their due diligence, they did their research, they did their analysis, and they were convinced as business people that it would work and that the market will embrace it. And they were right, they were spot on. I mean, I, I was amazed, right, when I heard what they had found in the marketplace. We find out most, most recently what, a, what some of the new uh, rental homes, high-end rentals that were developed over on Southern Boulevard and that new parcel that was annexed into the village. I asked them the same question. 
I'm told now they're almost, they're ahead of their schedule. They're, they're approaching 100% occupancy there. Because, and, and I had a long conversation about what is the market really doing? And believe me, the market is shifting in interesting ways that, you know, you don't realize unless you're really involved in, in, in looking at that kind of data and doing that kind of an analysis. So the same question will go, will, will, will be put forth to the folks who want to develop this, this property with the townhomes. With these issues that we need to have mitigated, all right, is it going to be something that's marketable? Because we don't want to see something built in the city, in the village, that's not going to be successful. Right? That's how we affect the positive side of maintaining the quality of life near the village. So I just want to kind of just put some of those points in, 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 uh, in, into context. And yes, um, as I said, thank you, uh, Doug, for, for giving us some insights. We have a lot of questions, and as you know, it will be a, it's going to be an interesting process if this is approved, getting through uh, site plan development and dealing with the issues and points that were raised. So with that said, would anyone else on council want to make any further comments? If not, then I'll look for a motion. Make a motion to approve ordinance number 1003. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Nay. Aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. One nay. Okay, Diane, please let the record show that the first reading uh, for agenda item R2 was approved 4 1. Okay. All right, thank you all for that. All right, moving on now to agenda item R3. Thank you. Uh, Doug, Doug, thank you. Okay. You got that, right? Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. The village of Royal Palm Beach, uh, the people want to leave. I'll give you a minute to depart. Thank you. Thank you all for coming, and thank you for your input. Thank you. No, we do listen, and we, we understand your concerns. Okay. Good night. You're going to hang in here with us? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you're the guy. Okay. That's right. I'm sitting there saying, I'm saying, boy, you look familiar. I was trying to place you. First, I thought you were with the newspaper, but okay. okay. All right. Uh, agenda item R3 is Village of Royal Palm Beach traffic calming presentation for Sparrow Drive, east of Royal Palm Beach. And are you there, village engineer? Chris? You're on. We got a picture. We got your, your presentation picture. We don't see you though. Yeah, but you, you don't do that. Traffic calming, one of our favorite subjects. Turn, unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Chris. Enter your audio pin. Do, right, Raymond? Same. There he goes. There he goes. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Hey, Thank we can you. Hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> I I apologize. My my computer my my computer just shut off for no reason. But I'm I'm back up. Don't you hate when that you happens? Can, you can see my screen, correct? Yes. It, it, it was 
fine for the first two hours and 45 minutes, and then right before the presentation, <laughs> it, it suddenly shut down. You like so, it. But <laughs> we're up and running. So, uh, tra traffic calming is the combination of mainly physical measures that reduce the negative I effects of motor vehicle use, alter driver behavior, and improve conditions for non-motorized street users. Why do we have a policy to, to reduce speeding and cut through traffic on local collector roadways, to provide a consistent and predictable criteria to support the use of traffic control devices, to justify continu continued use of traffic control devices on traffic calm streets? The benefits are reduced speeding, reduced cut through traffic, more consistent vehicle speeds, uh, and improved safety and quality of life. Uh, the negative impacts are it's going to slow down emergency emergency response, increased travel times, the cost, the maintenance, the noise, and the discomfort for drivers crossing the devices. Uh, what this is is a uh, flow chart of our policy. The green check marks are, are the things that have been completed thus far. Uh, the normal flow would have had the a residential request we would have done the preliminary assessment and then had a resident go out and get the 33% approval. Uh, in lieu of that, the council in 2017 uh, went ahead and did the traffic study. So that those two uh, things were flip-flopped. And when a resident uh, came to the council, uh, the decision was made to go ahead and, and get the 33% the um, and, then, and then come back to us. Uh, they did go, go out and get that 33%. Uh, they got 35 of the 41 residential units, uh, which is an 85% in favor ratio. Uh, one thing to note is uh, there is quite a few multifamily units that are contigu contiguous to Sparrow Drive, but they, they have parking lots in lieu of a uh, residential driveway that abuts the roadway. So 262 units were left out, out of the petition process. Uh, and this slide is going back to the study that was performed in 2017, and what it shows is that there, were, there was about 2,500 trips uh, during that 48-hour uh, study each day. Uh, the eastbound was at 34 miles per hour, westbound at 36 miles per hour for the 85 percentile speed. Uh, for the 95 percentile speed, it, it was 38 eastbound and, and 39 westbound. Uh, when you compare that to our criteria uh, eligibility to get traffic calming on the roadway, the volume w was within the, the, the criteria range. 85 per percentile speed was just over the 35 mile per hour uh, criteria that was required. And the, the 95 percentile speed was at 39, which did, did not meet the criteria. Um, <clears throat> and then, and then the, the engineer that performed the study came came up with this conclusion, which was since the vehicle speeds on Sparrow Drive east of Royal Palm Beach Boulevard were lower than the locations west of Royal Palm Beach Boulevard, and there are fewer homes abutting the roadway, it is recommended that radar speed signs be installed in each direction on Sparrow Drive segment east of Royal Palm Beach Boulevard. And this was the, the plan that they, they created for those speed signs. And here is what those signs would look like if they were installed. Can you go back to that? So the remaining step uh, for you tonight is whether we move forward with... Oh, it's okay. Excuse me? <laughs> Duh. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're good. <laughs> Did you have a question, Fred? It's been a long meeting. No, no, I'm good. I'm <laughs> paying no attention. The, ran the remaining steps are to... The remaining steps is to install the signs recommended by the engineering study or uh, to develop a speed pump plan and send ballots to the residents. And the considerations with, with doing that, that plan and is do we include the 262 multifamily units? Uh, do we allow them to vote? And then the other thing is, is the, the COVID-19 impact. And, you know, typically to get that 50% plus one, it requires somebody to go door to door and, and talk to those residents. And it, is that something that we, we want to encourage right now? So 
with, with that being said, I'll, I'll turn the floor back over to you, Mayor. I, I just want to get something clarified. <clears throat> in essence, you went through the process and did the analysis to determine the thresholds of whether there's really speeding or not speeding. Is that correct? Yes. That is correct. Is there a delay? There's a delay. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Um, and as a result of your analysis, was it like speeding like really bad based on this study or was it, you know, just above the, the threshold? How would you characterize that? It, it was one mile per hour above the threshold in, in one direction. In, in the other direction, it, it did not meet the criteria. One mile an hour in one direction, didn't meet it in the other, and it, didn't meet the 95 percentile threshold. So it barely made, made the that cut, so to speak. It, um, it, is that because of the characteristic of this road is basically one side of it is not really residential? It's kind of a few commercial places? Is it, yeah, is is the back of the of that the Royal Mall? Is that is that a factor in this? Why do you think the numbers came out the way they did? Uh, or or the curvature in the roadway. There there is if if you look at this slide, there there is a decent amount of curvature <laughs> in the roadway, which will naturally slow people down um, when when they come around the, those turns. Okay, the reason why I'm asking these questions is because it seems to me you, we've uh, done... Understanding the character of the road. I'm sorry. That was faulty. <laughs> Say again, last transmission. Chris? Are you, are you coming back to me? Yeah, you're, you're kind of breaking up. Um, I, here's... I thought you were saying something and I was talking while you were talking, so I, that's why I stopped talking. Here's, the question I guess I'm asking is, it seems to me that we have gone through the process for our procedure that we really normally would do. He's done the analysis, and it seems to me what Chris and his team has done is based on the results of the analysis, they have done a design recommendation. Correct. So that's really what we, that's what we do. We, well, did a recommendation from the engineer was to put up the, 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 yeah, the digital the signs, signs that say which is, how which fast is, you're going. Which I want you to understand. And we think that would mitigate the one mile an hour. We, yeah, see, let, let me explain this to you. When, when we put this contact, when we put this, this, this concept and this, this, this procedure together, one of the things that we do is staff has different options to recommend. A lot of people, I think, inadvertently fall into thinking that <clears throat> if we go through the process, it's going to result in, okay, let's put speed humps out there. That is not the case, right? The final design recommendation, as Chris is making tonight, is based on the analysis and the situation and taking all those other factors in, into, into consideration and saying, based on these factors, we believe this is the, the, the most appropriate option to follow to make an impact, all right? on what the speeding situation is. So I just want to, you know, you, you may have, we're going to give you a chance to go speak now and go on down to the podium. <laughs> Can I answer one more question on your sure. speed before go he goes? Go. One more question on your speed. And the reason we did 85 percentile and 95 percentile and we have a lower threshold for the, a lower percent threshold on the low 95 percentile, and the reason we did that was like on your long straight shots that people can get up to 50 miles an hour, um, we wanted that to be, to be a, a warm. Affected, yeah. You know, have that a, was not have something. Have a higher weight, a correct. rating. That right? was not something here, I will say, because of the curves. Okay. It wasn't like a sandpiper. Sir, please introduce yourself in. Seth Konigsberg, 156 Sparrow. Correct. After I came in, um, practically the next day, after I showed up last time, the uh, police were out and they had their radar signs up and if I recall they were issuing tickets. You're not going to issue a ticket for going one mile an hour over the speed limit. And what people do, and I, I watch, I live right there and I get stand outside <laughs> in the morning with my coffee I watch. They zoom down the street when I see the speed signs, they slow down, they stop. As soon as they pass that radar sign, they gun it and they're gone. <clears throat> um, 
I don't know what good the speed signs are going to do because some people just blow right by them. Um, I mean, personally, um, what you were saying, I am in favor of speed humps to um, slow down the speeders. Maybe the cut-through traffic, they will divert and go up to Okeechobee instead, and they can speed all they want up there, in, not in a residential area. Everyone I spoke to when I was doing my petition, the one you assigned me to do, Mr. Mayor. I didn't assign you. I told you you had the option, but that's okay. Well, and, and I accepted that option. Okay. And uh, a lot of people, I've heard stories of children almost getting hit by cars when they're checking the mail or when they're walking. I've heard stories of the, the people who go to the temple almost getting hit, and it's, it's just out of control. And I know, I realize the police can't be there all the time. They have more important things to do. There's crimes they have to follow up on, and they can't be chasing speeders. Face masks, too, yeah. Yeah, and face masks. <laughs> but um, I, I, as a resident there, see it as a problem, especially for the people who are using it as a cutthroat. Um, okay. And the people I spoke to on Royal Palm Beach Speaks and door-to-door -door when I was going door-to-door, -door, they are all in favor of a, another measure assigned than a speed sign. Okay, let's, let me, I'm glad you, you gave me a nice segue to the next really point of discussion, and that is, and I'm asking this question to Chris. Chris, how many, what's the, how many homes are in this study? How many houses are, 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 are within this study in terms of what you guys looked at and vis-a-vis -vis okay, what was done on the petition? You have 41 homes? For, for the, the petition that went out, there was 41 residential units uh, and 35 of, of the residents of those units were in favor of the, the calming. But it did not take into consideration the 262 multifamily units that, that also abut that roadway. But because uh, the way that our, our traffic criteria is written, we don't consider the, those multifamily uh, units because they don't have driveways that are directly abutting the roadway. They, they, they have parking lots, all street parking lots. Okay, you're talking about the, I mean, okay, you're not talking about the, because there are a series of homes that do have driveways abutting, but you're going all the way down. My time is up? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're done. No. <laughs> um, I, I, okay, I, so my question then is, if he were to go forward with, and we did the full election, if we went to forward and did the full, you know, looking for the 50% plus one, what boundaries? We wouldn't include the 262? That's, that's the question for council. We haven't had a roadway like this yeah. where it wasn't just all single family right, residential. Right. And that's why, you know, and we know that everybody who lives on there, the 242 plus the 41 are going to be impacted by these approximately eight to nine speed humps that would be put in. So if we were thinking, if council wants us to go forward with the 50% plus one vote, we really need to know whether you want to include those 242 multifamily units. But then our other caution is it's COVID-19 right now. Do you really want to incur have a policy and encourage people to go knocking door to door? Uh -huh. Well, I, I mean, it, it, it's, you know, but... No, no. We, he, we do mail. We but, do mail, and and and. Yeah. But the, but for him to get his fifty percent plus he's gotta one, go, he's got to knock on doors. He's probably going to have to do yeah. do do a, a mission like that, um, and that's why our recommendation is still let us put the signs up, and let's see what see see what that gets. Go ahead. So my question, real quick, just because we talked about this briefly a while back, is and and I do sympathize with your desire for them. I live on a roadway that was one of the four original that were studied, so I do, and mine's a straightaway, so there is nothing slowing them down. Um, what is the cost of putting that sign up versus the speed hump? So if we put the sign up and it doesn't work, we're out that money, and then if we have to put the humps in afterwards. If that is the final judgment, my other my other thought is though I think those 262 residents do need to be um, notified because it does impact them. When it comes down to the COVID part of it, if you're knocking on doors, um, have you noticed because the parks were closed before, there's less traffic going through, the schools are closed, so maybe holding off onto that portion till a few months from now. Have you noticed that it slowed down? 
in the beginning when everything shut down, yes, I did notice that. But as I guess things pro time progressed, now the speeding has picked back up. I, I, I see it every single day. Okay. Um, I think you make a valid point. It, it, I, I, I can answer the question. No, go ahead. What question do you want? Cost. Cost. Okay. I'm listening. We're listening. <laughs> the question uh, related to cost, it's about $8,000 for the two signs. And uh, another point concerning the signs is they, they collect data on, on the speed. That's right. That's right. Uh, which which we'll, we could use to, to further evaluate the roadway. Okay. We will get daily data, uh, you know, every, every day we're, we'll be able to get feeds on that and okay. and further analyze the, the issues out there. And how many of these are we, are we, what we put out? Two? One for each way? Okay. You think that's, that's sufficient? Two. To start with? To start with? Okay. Correct. Okay. So if I fr were to frame the recommendation that's coming forth to us is improve this, let's continue to evaluate based on additional data we're going to be collecting and leave the option open down the road, hopefully when we're beyond COVID-19. In other words, we're not taking away the option at some point down the road for you to go and ask for the full 50% plus one. And I think we're also saying if we did that, we want to include these 262 units. Is that yes. what we're saying? So, so yes, and, and I, I just wanted to verify that not going to need to go 50% plus one to get the signs, right? No, no they're recommending that already. And so, so that's the current recommendation. Yeah. One of the benefits of this and the ability to go back and, and revisit it later is we don't just get the one week okay. of, I, I know of information. We get a continuous get a con over right. a long period of time indication of how well those signs are working or not. And then we have a really, really solid basis for deciding whether there's something in addition to or in replacement of those signs that really would be required. And I, I, I agree with uh, Selena that, you know, we, we should include those other residents because they would be affected. Absolutely. Uh, if we were to go forward, we have to include them. Time. I want to give a chance because uh, you did mention, and I know it myself because I've seen it myself, the uh, increase of presence of uh, PBSO. Captain Aox, do you want to shed any light on, on this? Please sit down and thank you, sir. Thank you. No, thank you. For taking the initiative. Yes. Mayor Council, good evening, sir. How are you tonight? Well, what the individual stated when he first set up, and this was Tony's question, right, um, was that we went out there the next day. That's absolutely correct. And we went out there and we started monitoring the traffic problems as he allegedly had there. Um, we did find some instances of speeding. However, having gone out there personally and sent motor units and deputies out there, it wasn't as bad as perhaps it may seem. I mean, visually, it looked like cars were coming around the corner. And then when we actually got the radar laser up and, and took the actual speed measurement, it looked like they were going faster than they actually are. So some of the numbers that I heard Chris present were, were consistent with some of what we saw. We wound up doing you know, some written warnings and some traffic citations. So we, we did see something, but not as bad as perhaps it, it may have appeared to but. Were you able to determine a notion of whether or not it was there were people who lived there that were doing this, or people trying to do a pass through? It appears that there were people trying to pass through. The pass throughs. Yep. Okay. All right. Okay. Validate some of your points. Okay. Uh, you have any thoughts on what's being recommended this evening? I agree with what the village manager engineer is proposing. Okay. The signs first, and if that doesn't work, then move on to the next we'll move step. On. Okay. Any other questions from members of council? I, are we clear on what we're asking to decide on? If we are, can somebody draft a motion for us? Please tell me. So it's a, that's what I'm saying. That's what, right. you know. Before, before you do that, yeah. I need to do one more thing. Um, although we have indicated uh, early notice to the electronic meeting members of the public, and we encourage them to provide a uh, comment to the village clerk prior to the meeting via email or phone. 
I'd like to confirm with the village clerk whether or not we have received any comments on agenda item R3. No comments on this agenda item. Okay. I have not received any comment cards from the public. There's only one public here. <laughs> so, so I think we should close public comment then on agenda item R3. And with that, Selena, continue, please. I make a motion to approve two electronic signs on Sparrow Drive East. Second. Second. Okay, we have a second and a motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? There are no opposed. Diane, please let the record show that agenda item R3 is approved 5-0. And let, also let the record show that, that at some point down the road, we're going to evaluate information that we receive from these units that are put in place. And hopefully we get beyond COVID-19. And the option for a full uh, vote is still down there and based on the, you know, the analysis of it. Hopefully it's approved in and we'll see where we are. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, we have found we have found in the past. Well, we'll send out we'll send out the, 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 the voting thing, but we have found out in the past, unless somebody, some people in that community actually goes around and talks to people, because what'll happen is they'll get it in the mail and they'll just like like junk mail sometimes. So it does require somebody, in the, you know, because we've had other, we've had communities where we've done the analysis, we did the presentation to the people to tell them here's what we're proposing. Uh, now they, because the, the point is, is to present to you what we want to do and ask you to vote on us. You're not voting in the dark, so to speak, okay? Well, I'm just telling you, but, but it, think about this. It's not just the folk, now this is expanded. It would include all 262 of those other. So there, there was a lot of legwork. That, that, that's the only point we want to make to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much thank you. for coming and Appreciate being involved. That. Should we wait for Jan? Well, we might need to here. We've got to get Brad. Bradford. Are you, I don't see his phone on. He needs to enter his appearance. Where is that? He left? No, he's there. And he's got his presentation up. I just. Bradford, can you. Uh, But we'll use up the bracket time. Yeah, we'll time to get sit, Yeah, so we may as well wait for him. <laughs> okay, we got him now. He's Thank ready? You Brad. Thank you, Bradford. <laughs> okay. Hey, can you hear me? Okay, good. All right, agenda item R4 is a public hearing for first reading and approval of ordinance number 1004, amending chapter 20, signs of the code of ordinances of the village of Royal Palm Beach at article 4, permitted signs at section 20-57. Public ownership district or other village owned property in order to increase the size limitations for freestanding monument signs on village owned property. This should be interesting. Bradford, you're on. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, you pretty much um, hit the nail on the head with that um, introduction. We are requesting that we increase from 30 square feet in area for freestanding monument signs to 42 square feet with a maximum height of uh, seven feet and eight feet in width. And with that being said, Mayor, uh, we are recommending approval and I'll turn the floor back over to you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Is there a comment? No. Okay. I want to make a motion. Oh, hold it. <laughs> Okay. Since, since, if that's perfectly clear to everyone on what we're doing here, that we're, that's a good thing. But before we do that, uh, um, before we take public comment from members of the public present here and on the line tonight, uh, in the notice of electronic meeting, members of the public were encouraged to provide public comments to the village clerk prior to the meeting via email or phone. I'd like to confirm at this time with the village clerk whether we have any comments presented for agenda item R4. No comment, Mayor. No comments submitted. Okay. We have no one here <laughs> to ask if they would like to <laughs> comment, so we will close public comment on agenda item all four. And now, unless there's comment from members on council, if none, I'll look for a motion. I make a motion to approve regular agenda item four. Second. We have a motion and a second. Oh, come on. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Any opposed? 
Well, let the record show we have no opposed that the agenda <laughs> item off four was approved by a vote of five zero with, with much laughter. <laughs> okay. And with that? With that, no further business before us this evening. In terms of, uh, I think we're probably going to say, uh, at least with the model that we have here in terms of going forward, we may have some modification in terms of the public participation. So when is our next meeting? Uh, by the yeah. way? And this is a budget hearing, budget workshop? Okay. When will we see budget books? Um, All right. Make sure uh, Chris sends a uh, reminder to us to come, come get them. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Nothing else? No further business? We stand adjourned.